Harry Truman. This program is about two and a half hours. He was the man from Missouri, a farmer's son who fought in World War I and married the first girl he ever loved. Harry Truman was perceived by many as honest and moral. As president, Truman kept a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here. He also displayed a quote by Mark Twain, always do right, it read. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. My choice early in life was either to be a piano player in a whorehouse or a politician. And to tell the truth, there's hardly a difference. Truman grew up in Independence, Missouri. He wore glasses and, to avoid breaking them, obediently refrained from outdoor games, turning instead to quieter pursuits, such as practicing the piano and reading books. His favorites profiled historical figures, and he soon came to admire the likes of Hannibal and Robert E. Lee. Also in his mind was Bess Wallace, a classmate he met in Sunday school. As a young man, Truman courted her persistently, proposing twice before she accepted in 1917. They wed two years later and would have a daughter, Margaret. The year of his wedding, Truman was 35 and had yet to find his niche in life. He'd already been a farmer, a railroad timekeeper, a bank clerk, and a volunteer officer in the First World War. Along the way, an unlucky business investment had cost him dearly, and his new clothing store would go under in three years, leaving him in severe debt. But such setbacks challenged Truman, whose tenacity grew from a belief in his own success. I've always had a sneaking notion that someday, maybe, I'd amount to something, he once wrote Bess. The year his store closed, Truman was elected a Missouri County judge. It was an entry into public service that, in his own words, quote, just happened. But it was facilitated by the backing of a Missouri political mentor named Thomas Pendergast, whose support also helped Truman land a seat in the U.S. Senate 12 years later, in 1934. Truman enjoyed the boisterous nature of the Senate. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen, he liked to say. His enthusiasm sometimes got the better of him, however, and he would later become known for his feisty spirit and salty language. Truman displayed his fiery side the day he learned of President Roosevelt's wish to make him his running mate in the 1944 election. Reluctant to leave the Senate, Truman declared, tell him to go to hell. He eventually relented, however, and the next November was elected vice president, serving three months before Roosevelt died. When they told me what had happened, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. After Roosevelt's death, he learned about the atomic bomb, a weapon he'd use four months later to precipitate the end of World War II. Truman worked hard to steer the nation into the post-war era but his popularity dropped from 90% in August of 1945 to 34% by September of 1946. People joked that to err was Truman and observed that if a man like Harry Truman could become president, anybody could. That didn't stop him from seeking a return to the Oval Office in 1948. By that time, a Republican victory seemed so imminent that Truman's own mother-in-law considered his chances slim but the odds were familiar ones to Truman, whose subsequent defeat of Republican Thomas Dewey would become one of the biggest political upsets in American history. His second term, marked by American intervention in Korea and mounting tensions with the Soviet Union, was more challenging than his first, and Truman's approval ratings again began to sink. He declined to seek re-election in 1952 and left office the following year. Truman returned to Independence, where he began work on his memoirs. He also lectured at universities and traveled the country stumping for the Democrats. In retirement, he refused to profit personally through speaking or consulting fees, noting that as president, he tried never to forget who he was and where he was returning. He died the day after Christmas in 1972 at age 88. Peace, my friend is the goal of my public life. 
I'd rather have a lasting peace in the world than to be President of the United States. Welcome to Independence, Missouri, the hometown of Harry S. Truman, our 33rd president, and the site chosen for the Truman Presidential Library. We're inside with Truman biographer Alonzo Hamby in the recreation of Mr. Truman's Oval Office for our American President Series program on Harry S. Truman. Dr. Hamby, we heard Harry Truman talk about the library. How involved was he in this building? Uh, well, he raised the money for it, first of all. Uh, he uh, approved the site. He took an interest in the architecture. Uh, he, was, he was very involved, but of course for an institution like this, raising the money is, is paramount. Welcome to our program, and if you've been watching as the series progresses, this is stop number 33 for us. The most important part that makes this work is your involvement. We'll be going to your telephone calls in just a couple of minutes about Harry Truman and your questions about his administration and life. Here are the phone numbers, 202-624-1111 if you live in the eastern half of the United States, and those in the western half should use 202-624-1115. Well, let's start with the circumstances that brought him into office. How did he become president? Uh, he was vice president of the United States, having been elected in 1944 after 12 years in the Senate. Less than three months into his vice presidency, Franklin D. Roosevelt died, and uh, quite unexpectedly, Harry Truman was president. How prepared was he for the job? Uh, well, he was well prepared in the sense of having a wide range of political experience. Uh, he was poorly prepared in the sense of having immediate information and being ready at once to take over. What do you mean by that? Uh, he had uh, actually very little contact with President Roosevelt during his vice presidency. Uh, he knew little or nothing about the atomic bomb. He, he knew in a very general way that there was a major project underway to develop a new explosive. but. Uh, we're, we're not even sure he had heard the words atomic bomb before he became president. What was the state of the war when he took office? Uh, the United States was winning the war. Uh, victory in Europe was clearly a matter of weeks away. Uh, the war in the Pacific, on the other hand, still looked as if it might be a long slog and might well last into mid-1946. Let's take our first telephone call, Bus Die, New York. Good morning. Good morning, C-SPAN. It's uh, a pleasure to speak with you this morning, and I have a couple questions, if I may. Uh, uh, Harry S. Truman was a, uh, a distinguished Freemason, but his uh, uh, association with Robert H. Jackson and the establishment of the uh, International War Crimes uh, Tribunal really uh, uh, stands out, and I just wonder if the professor could comment on uh, uh, both Truman's Masonic activity and his uh, interaction with Robert Howard Jackson. Uh, well, the, the Masonic Lodge was a very important part of Truman's life. Uh, he joined the Masons when he was still a farmer in Grandview, Missouri uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, it was uh, really an essential activity to him. Like many politicians, he, uh, he had a lot of fraternal affiliations, but the Masons were always by far the most important. Uh, he served a year as Grand Master Mason of Missouri in 1940. Uh, as to Justice Jackson, uh, there, was, there wasn't, to my knowledge, uh, an, an intimate relationship between them. Uh, uh, friendly, cordial, professional. Uh, the War Crimes Tribunal at Nuremberg uh, would have been established uh, regardless of whether Truman was president. So I, I think his association with that was rather peripheral. Can you talk a little bit about the influence that a uh, childhood in Missouri gave to him? Uh, well, Truman grew up in what I like to describe as sort of a neo-frontier environment. Uh, Western Missouri had been a wild and woolly place in the generation before he was born. Uh, during the Civil War, it was the scene of uh, a lot of really nasty guerrilla skirmishes. Uh, Independence, Missouri in the 1890s, which 
Young Harry moved there with his family in 1890 when he was six years old. Uh, he lived here in Independence until uh, he graduated from high school. Uh, was uh, still a pretty rough place. Uh, the uh, biggest businesses on the courthouse square were the saloons. Uh, brawls between grown men were common and a relatively accepted way of people settling their differences. Right outside of where we are in the lobby of this building is a mural. Very, you can't miss it when you walk in. And uh, it is uh, a depiction of this area, the western frontier mm -hmm. at the time. What is this area known for? What are the characteristics and qualities that uh, one might see in this work of art? Uh, well, this uh, is a mural by the artist Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, the title, I think, is Independence and the Winning of the West, or, or something along those lines. This was the starting point for the Oregon Trail and the Santa Fe Trail in, in the mid-19th century. Uh, it, uh, it's a town that really has a, a, a rich background and history of that sort. And so if you were born and raised here in this time, your thoughts were of the limitless possibilities of the West? Uh, well, I think, yeah, the thoughts are certainly of limitless possibilities. Uh, Truman grew up in a, a society that really believed in, in rags to riches, with hard work, pluck, a little bit of luck, uh, a person could get ahead, could become rich. Uh, Truman had a grandfather on his mother's side, a fascinating fellow named Solomon Young, uh, who had come from Kentucky, uh, had made by the standards of western Missouri a modest fortune. He uh, was a major landowner uh, in, in this area, had made a considerable amount of money as a freight hauler uh, hauling freight out west all, all the way to California. And Solomon Young apparently had a lot of frontier stories to tell his grandchildren. Canton, Ohio. Uh, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, um, my name is Kurt Herner. I'm 22 years old and a human social service major in college. And as long as I can remember, I have been a very huge fan of President Truman. And I was wondering if he had any other influence on the generation before me or possibly the generation I'm in right now? Uh, I think Harry Truman has become for a lot of people a rather iconic figure. Uh, the uh, blunt, plain-spoken, decisive individual who said what was on his mind and acted. Uh, I, I think for a lot of people he has uh, a certain aura of authenticity that we don't see a lot of in public life these days. We heard him talking about the fact that he was president during a crucial time in American yeah. history. We're going to show you a clip about the Declaration of Victory in Europe and then talk about more about the war. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light. Just a few blocks from here on his home in Delaware Avenue sits his final automobile and the license plate is VE Day. That's the numbers he yes. chose for it. Yes. You know, I think one of the interesting things about that announcement is the way he invokes Franklin Roosevelt's name right at the beginning. And he does so appropriately, but uh, a lot of politicians might want to leave their predecessors out of an announcement like that. I, I think that tells one something about Truman, but uh, maybe more to the point, uh, almost from the time he becomes president, uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, he's at about the end of his fourth week as president when he makes this announcement. He's faced with the whole problem of the future of Europe uh, after this devastating war. At the same time, he's still waging war on another front. We'll yes, talk indeed. about that after another call. Martinsville, Virginia, good morning.
Good morning. This is Betty Jo Philpott Martin in Martinsville, Virginia. I would like to uh, have a little bit more information on what uh, President Truman had to do with uh, the 509th, 393rd that dropped the atomic bomb. We have just returned from Washington on the 54th uh, anniversary, and we've just received a citation after 54 years of this group who uh, ended the war in Japan. Thanks very much. Talk about the decision-making process. The decision to drop the atomic bomb was, in one sense, it was a non-decision because it had always been assumed that this weapon was going to be used when it was developed. Uh, when Truman was informed of its impending uh, uh, completion, he appointed a committee to give him a recommendation, a committee of politicians with a couple of scientists on it. Uh, but there was, I think, no real dissent on the committee about using the bomb. It was more a matter of how, when, and where. Uh, the key person on that committee was uh, probably Henry L. Stimson, who was Secretary of War. Uh, and it was Stimson who really worked incessantly to make sure that it wouldn't be dropped on the city of Kyoto, which uh, is the cultural center of Japan, and which the Air Force thought would be a great target since it hadn't been touched during the war. Uh, there, was, there was really no doubt that it was going to be used. Uh, the bomb was tested on July 15th, 1945 at Alamogordo, uh, and uh, subsequently the first one was dropped three weeks later on Hiroshima. The caller asked about his involvement with the bomb group. Uh, well, I, I really don't know anything about that. I suspect he had an opportunity to, uh, to meet at least some of them at, at some point in the future. Uh, but, uh, of course, this was a working group that was already established and had been spending uh, months training before he became president. Your book describes him as a man who never looked back after he made a decision. Even this one? Uh, I think he always thought he made the right decision. Uh, I think he was somewhat uncomfortable with it. Uh, there's, there's a very telling remark he makes at a cabinet meeting on August 10th, 1945. This is after the second bomb has been dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, the first feelers have come from Japan about surrender. He tells the members of his cabinet that he has given orders to hold off on the shipments of components for a third bomb to the Pacific. Uh, and he says, I don't want to kill any more kids. Uh, so he was, he was very aware that this was a weapon that uh, was killing a lot of civilians indiscriminately. Uh, he was uncomfortable with that. But I think at the same time, uh, he, uh, he thought, uh, and thought even in later years as he looked back on it, that this was still the way the war had to be ended as quickly as possible. Pasadena, California. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I actually have a question about the library itself. Um, only yesterday I found a brochure in an old bookstore. It looks like it's from 1967, and there's a reference made to the Truman Suites at the, um, at the library. I'm wondering, did um, President Truman keep an office at the library when he was still alive? Yes, he did. Uh, he uh, kept a large office suite, uh, which was run by the same woman who had been his private secretary in the White House. Her name was Rose Conway. Uh, and uh, he, was, uh, he used it very actively for a period of uh, six to eight years before his health started to decline. And in your final chapter of the book, you say it was a mixed blessing for researchers having him here. Why was that? Uh, well, it was uh, sort of a mixed blessing in two senses. One, one of them uh, was simply that uh, he kept all his private papers, all the things that the historians would call the good stuff, uh, in his own office while he was alive, although he, he left all that material to the people of the United States and to the library at his death. Uh, he 
like to say he was available to answer questions, but I, I've been told by people who did research here when he was still active uh, that his uh, activities, when he walked into the research room, would be to stop, typically to stop briefly at a table and say, I hope you're finding out what you, I hope you're finding what you wanted to find uh, without ever waiting for an answer. Uh, which in a good many cases that early would have been no. <laughs> Next call, Alexander, Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to comment again about the uh, museum in, in, in the library. I first visited the museum in uh, 1972 or 73, I guess. And I remember uh, even before that when President Truman was describing how the museum was going to be organized, he said that what he wanted to do was not have so much of a museum of his life, but a museum that would explain the presidency to people. And if you visit the, the office where you are sitting, there's a recording of President Truman's voice that says that. And when I first visited the library in the early 70s, uh, it seemed to be arranged that way. But I visited it again with my wife last Saturday, uh, and I found it was, it was very differently arranged, and I, and I was a bit disappointed. Um, I wanted to comment that, and I've kind of made a point of being up this morning to listen to your show. Uh, Truman's one of my great heroes, but I did think um, that someone perhaps from the library might want to comment on why the library, the museum's arranged the way it is now and what the, the overriding theme is. I couldn't determine that when we were there. Thanks very much. Why don't we, we're going to talk to the director of the library real soon, so why don't we uh, hold off your questions on its role um, for him because he can talk about some of the current plans for it. As a researcher, how is it to use it? You've spent a lot of time here. Uh, it uh, couldn't be a better place to do academic research. Uh, the, uh, the research part of the library is separate from the museum. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's an all-around swell place, a very helpful, friendly staff. Uh, uh, I'd recommend it to anyone. Let's take a call from Munster, Indiana. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was on vacation a couple of years ago in uh, Key West, Florida, and I re seem to remember there was a house there that Truman stayed at uh, regularly during his presidency. And I wanted to know if you could uh, comment on why he liked to go to Key West. Was, uh, was Truman something of a snowbird? Did he like to go there in the winter? And uh, while he was there, um, uh, what, did he, what did he enjoy doing? Perhaps also you could comment a little bit more generally uh, what were some of Truman's recreational interests. Thank you. The house in Key West was on the old naval base there. Uh, Truman first went down there, I believe, in 1946, and uh, he, uh, he did like the sun. Uh, he uh, enjoyed the beach, liked to swim. Uh, it was his, maybe his favorite place. Uh, he uh, also liked to play poker in the evenings with uh, uh, the staff people and friends that he brought down with him. Uh, there were logs kept of his activities for every day that he was there. You, you won't find the poker games mentioned in them. Uh, you're likely to find a reference that says something to the effect that after dinner the president visited with his friends. I'm going to show you the Truman Doctrine table. What is the Truman Doctrine? The Truman Doctrine was the... Uh, name given to some principles that Truman laid down in a speech in March 1947, which is more or less an official declaration of the Cold War. Uh, the immediate occasion for the speech was to ask Congress to appropriate money to aid Greece and Turkey, uh, both of which were under uh, threats from the Soviet Union, Greece through a, a communist led guerrilla movement, uh, Turkey through diplomatic pressure. Uh, but the speech also stated a general principle that it should be the policy of the United States to help free peoples threatened by foreign aggression. Uh, it was clearly aimed at the Soviet Union. Everyone knew it at the time. Uh, there had been uh, other incidents that you can say mark the start of something like the Cold War, but this was the first really official pronouncement. Here's Harry Truman talking about the Truman Doctrine. One aspect of the present situation, which I present to you at this time for your consideration and decision, concerns Greece and Turkey. 
The very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Should we fail to aid Greece and Turkey in this fateful hour, the effect will be far-reaching to the West as well as to the East. We must take immediate and resolute action. Dr. Alonzo Hamby, talk about the significance of what became known as the Truman Doctrine on late 20th century American policy. Well, in, in some ways, those, those words still live with us. They're very, very general words, perhaps a bit more general than they should have been. Uh, but uh, from, from this point on, uh, we have felt, I, I think, that we have a special duty to try to stabilize the world, uh, to uh, try to act uh, at least in a number of instances where we seem to have some kind of stake as a policeman. And it became clear that it was our role based on the role we took in World War II, this country took? Well, I think it was a natural outgrowth of World War II. Uh, and there's a, there's a very interesting debate at the time the war is over with as to whether uh, the United States is going to return to isolation as it more or less did after World War I or whether it's going to be an active leader. Uh, and Truman was very much on the side of the active leader people. Long Beach, California. Oh, hi. Uh, basically, I'm a really big fan of the library. I've been there a couple times. Um, one thing that's really neat is you can go in the gift shop and you can actually buy recorded tapes of Truman's speeches. And I find this to be really, really you know, fascinating stuff. Last time I went, I actually got uh, a three-day speech, basically. It was, uh, I think, done in Columbia University in the 50s, and he spoke three days. Once he talked about the presidency, uh, the second day he spoke about the Constitution, but the third day he chose kind of an interesting topic. He talked about the, um, the role of hysteria in, uh, in American history, and I think this was right during the heart, of the, like the heart of the McCarthy era, and he kind of followed a pattern of every 30 years or so, we have a period, 30 or 40 years, we have a period of uh, hysteria. And he traced it all the way back to the, um, uh, basically the Salem witches and uh, brought it to like anti-Masonic and the anti-anarchist, you know, red scares of the 20s up to the, the 50s. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. And when I heard it was kind of during the the whole impeachment thing, and I, I wondered if, if he were around, if, if he would think that we might be in a kind of a similar, kind of uh, maybe like an anti-Clinton uh, hysteria period. Or, how, how old are you? Um, I'm 31. And of course then, never lived during a period of Harry Truman's life. How did you become interested in him? Well, um, I don't know. I think it was in, uh, in college. Um, I just, I majored in political science, and uh, I was, you know, kind of interested in history, and uh, I, I thought it was kind of one thing that kind of caught my attention. I took a civil rights course, and I found out that uh, I think uh, Truman, by desegregating the military, kind of started the whole, you know, civil rights thing. And I just think he really, in this era of just political slickness and uh, superficial just imagery that... You know, it's really refreshing. Occasionally, I'll go back and read some of his words or listen to those tapes, and you know, you really can hear just uh, you know, just an honest person talking and uh, laying it out like a pragmatism that, that we really don't have today. Thanks for your call. Why does Harry Truman seem to be more popular today than he was when he was in office? <clears throat> well, I, I I think part of that is probably that we remember his good qualities more than we remember his weaknesses. I think most of us would probably agree that uh, while he made some mistakes, on the whole his decisions were good ones, uh, and uh, the country was probably a better place at the end of his presidency than, he was, than it was when he began it. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of merit to a record there. I think uh, 
uh, he was president in a very difficult, turbulent time, and uh, there were a lot of emotions connected with the issues of his presidency, uh, and strong feelings have sort of eroded over the years. And we, we think of his good qualities, just as the, the caller conceived of him today. Let's introduce you to Larry Hackman, who is the director of the Harry Truman Library, been in that position since 1995, and president of the Truman Library Institute for National and International Affairs. Mr. Hackman, I must do your heart good to know that half of our callers already this morning have been to the library. We had a very specific question from someone wanting to know what, are, what you are trying to do. What are you trying to capture inside these walls? Well, a uh, couple of the questions uh, deserve a response, I think. Lon mentioned that uh, Harry Truman's chief role with regard to the library was fundraising, but the question uh, from one of your callers uh, really referred to another one. Truman, in his modesty, felt that this place should not be a monument or a memorial to him, uh, but a place where people would come to learn about government and politics and the presidency. And so, in contrast to all the other presidential libraries, it didn't start off with permanent exhibits on the Truman presidency or on the life and times of Harry Truman, and we're only catching up and doing that in a world-class way uh, quite a few years later. What are you uh, hoping to do with the library? Uh, we're well along toward a new fundraising effort, $22.5 million project, to create uh, what you see wrapped around behind me is a, a model of the 11,000 square foot uh, permanent exhibit on the Truman presidency. There'll be a second major permanent exhibit on the life and times of Harry Truman, a new temporary exhibition gallery, a learning center on decision making and citizenship, which is very consistent with Harry Truman's uh, original uh, vision of the library and our own vision statement and our strategic plan, which is that people will be enriched and inspired to become better citizens through the programs of the Truman Library. When will it all be finished? Uh, the permanent exhibit on the Truman presidency opens in uh, May of 2001. Uh, the Learning Center opens in the fall of 2001. The Life and Times of Harry Truman opens in early 2002, so really over the next couple of years. What will it be like for visitors to the library in the intervening years? <laughs> uh, well, someone referred to the fact that uh, they enjoyed the library, but they wondered what the central theme is. And in fact, uh, there is no central theme. You can almost think of the Truman Library uh, over most of its uh, history as being a uh, mix of uh, temporary exhibits, and that will continue over the next uh, couple of years. You will see a couple of them uh, later in your program uh, this morning, particularly uh, Dear Bess, uh, Love Letters from the President, uh, which will be up throughout the renovation period. Uh, will be closed for three months from September uh, through November of the year 2000. Other than that, we'll, uh, we, we will have uh, various exhibits opening throughout. Can you explain uh, when people can visit now and how much it costs? Uh, our uh, top price uh, for adults is uh, five dollars and then there are lower fees for uh, seniors, uh, students, uh, students who come in uh, groups uh, are admitted uh, free, uh, younger visitors are, are admitted uh, free and you can come here uh, any day uh, open at 9 o'clock every day except uh, Sunday. We open at, uh, we're open from 12 to 5 on Sundays and we're open Thursday evenings till 9. I think we have some B-roll of the house on Delaware Street. Can you explain what else people can see if they come to Independence, Missouri? Well, they can see uh, the Truman Home, uh, which is operated by the uh, Park Service. They can see Clinton's Drug Store on Independence Square where Harry uh, held his uh, first uh, job as a young man. They can see the Truman Courthouse in the Courthouse in Independence uh, uh, Square uh, where he had an office when he was, it was called a county judge, but really it was an executive uh, uh, office, what we might today call county supervisor. Uh, and uh, the church where Harry and Bess were uh, uh, born, uh, were, <laughs> were married. You can easily make a day of it then. You can certainly make a, a, a day of it and there's a lot, uh, there, there are a lot of other sites uh, in Independence, uh, the uh, Frontier Trails uh, 
museum uh, being one. A lot of early Mormon history uh, is here, so a lot to see. How many visitors does the library have each year? We have about 130,000 uh, at this point, and we expect that to increase considerably when we open our new permanent exhibits. A little later on, we'll meet a couple of your curators, mm -hmm. but uh, can you talk about what researchers have access to here? Uh, there is virtually nothing that uh, isn't uh, open to researchers. We have about uh, 15 million documents. About half of those came uh, through the uh, Truman deed of gift, which Lon referred to. Those are the White House files, uh, files from his period in the United States Senate, his personal and business matters, and so on. Uh, and the other, and then there are 400 other collections of the people around uh, Truman, the files of Dean Acheson, Acheson from that period, his Secretary of State, which are particularly rich, files of Clark Clifford, his special counsel from that period, also a very rich collection. Uh, lots of White House staff members uh, who are not household names, uh, um, Tom Clark, uh, his Attorney General, John Snyder, his uh, Secretary of the Treasurer, Treasury, uh, and so on. Let's uh, go back to your point about the fundraising for the expansion and renovation. Uh, could you explain the whole funding system for a presidential library like this one? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that there's any standard. Every presidential library receives an annual appropriation from Washington to basically operate the uh, facility to uh, repair the leaks in the uh, roof most of the time. Uh, to operate the archives and reference uh, services to take care of the collections. But any time a library new or particularly a mature library like the Truman Library undertakes a major project, it involves lots of private uh, fundraising. Most of my time these days goes not to learning about Harry Truman, but to fundraising. Of this $22.5 million project, Eight million dollars of that is a one-time federal appropriation to upgrade the facility itself. Two million dollars of that is a new appropriation from the state of Missouri, which we very much appreciate. And the other uh, uh, twelve and a half million dollars is private fundraising. And what is your specific relationship with the National Archives? Uh, we are, like all of the other modern presidential libraries except the Nixon Library, a part of the Office of Presidential Libraries within the National Archives. My immediate supervisor is the director of the Office of Presidential Libraries uh, in Washington. Uh, we depend upon them for uh, a good deal of our annual operating uh, budget, and we live within their uh, guidelines for the way we make materials uh, available to researchers and, and in some of the other ways in which we operate the place. But there's a good deal of flexibility on the museum side, on educational programs, and so on. Well, thank you for your hospitality and allowing C-SPAN cameras to come here this morning. And we look forward uh, to continuing our program and meeting other members of your staff. Great. Enjoy the rest of your stay. Let's return to telephone calls on Harry Truman. Hanover County, Virginia. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, the reason I'm calling is uh, I uh, am interested to uh, know uh, about President Truman's uh, uh, I understand that he had a lack of a college education. He didn't attend college. I was wondering if you ever felt that this hindered him in any way. Uh, and I was also wondering about the Truman Scholars Program, if you could give me some background, how that was started, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Thank you very much. Well, let me speak to the lack of a college experience, uh, because I, I think uh, it's a little bit beneath the surface. Uh, Truman was a bit sensitive about that in later years. but. The fact is, in the, at the time he grew up and in the society in which he grew up, uh, most high school graduates did not go to college. Uh, he uh, attended a business school briefly. Uh, he read widely uh, on an independent basis. And like, like most people who are rather self-educated, uh, uh, he uh, picked up history, other forms of knowledge in, in, in bits and pieces rather than systematically. Uh, he attended law school for two years in the 1920s while he was a county judge. And yes, you could attend law school in those days uh, without uh, having a college degree. Uh, did pretty well, actually, but uh, he, he never completed the curriculum. 
so there's, there's no higher education there, but uh, you still have a uh, highly intelligent, well-read individual uh, who, by the standards of, let's say, most members of the Senate, in which he spent 12 years, uh, or excuse me, 10 years, uh, in the 30s and early 40s, uh, he was uh, something of an intellectual. Next call for Truman biographer Lon Hamby is from Black Canyon City, Arizona. Good morning, Susan, and to your guest there, uh, Terry Elliott here, and uh, born in Missouri, and uh, started grade school in 1941, so very familiar with World War II, and also in Korea. Uh, well, I believe that uh, Harry Truman did exactly the right thing with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think he made grave errors in uh, Korea, particularly on the firing of uh, General Douglas MacArthur, and it kind of set the stage for things that are still happening today, particularly with China and communism. And I'd like to have uh, the author's comments and, uh, about this, please. Well, the gravest error in Korea was being totally unprepared for an attack there, and uh, having quite inadvertently left the communist world with the impression that uh, an attack might not be answered by the United States. Uh, on the firing of MacArthur, on the other hand, which is, I, I think, one of the things that people remember Truman most for, it's hard for me to see that he had much of a choice because the, uh, the relationship had deteriorated into one of systematic insubordination on General MacArthur's part. Uh, he uh, uh, not only disagreed with the administration plan to concentrate relatively diminished American resources on Europe, uh, but he was also uh, just just plain insubordinate about it, and whatever the merits of his position, uh, is just simply uh, the uh, business of the civilians running the military uh, alone dictated that he was going to have to go. Dora Alabama on Harry Truman. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask your author uh, uh, why did. Uh, President Truman refer to the Korean War as a police action, and uh, I'd like to get his comment on that. That was, uh, to say the least, an unfortunate phrase. It was one that he used very early on after the decision to intervene when we were still quite underestimating the strength and capabilities of the North Koreans. Uh, although, uh, as things turned out, uh, we, we demonstrated that even ill-prepared, we were capable of beating the North Koreans in a matter of months, uh, and the war dragged on uh, because China intervened, uh, a possibility that was uh, quite unforeseen at, at the beginning uh, of the war. But no one will question, it was much more than a police action, and that was a very badly chosen phrase. Independence, Missouri is now today a bedroom community of Kansas City. It takes you about 25 minutes to drive from the Kansas City Airport. He was born in a town called Lamar, Missouri. Where is that compared to where we are? It's about 100 miles uh, straight south of here. Uh, young Harry lived there only very briefly. His father and mother had moved down there to establish a livestock trading business. Uh, and this, this, as a matter of fact, was his father's business for, uh, for much of his father's life. Uh, they decided to come back uh, uh, into Jackson County, the county that Independence is located in, uh, because uh, both their families lived there. And uh, uh, Mrs. Truman's father, Solomon Young, uh, especially wanted uh, Harry's father, John Truman, to uh, help him out on the, uh, the big farm that Solomon Young owned uh, in Grandview. How many brothers and sisters? Uh, Truman had one brother, John Vivian. Uh, he had one, uh, uh, one sister, Mary Jane. And where was he in the lineup? He was the oldest. Next call for Lon Hamby is from Champaign, Illinois. Champaign, Illinois. Um, I would like your author to uh, comment on why Harry Truman, will we 
was the sole possessor of the atomic bomb, done the world such a disservice by not stating that anybody even test an atomic bomb were going to declare war on you then and there. That's before Russia and all the other ones had it perfected. Why didn't he do the world uh, service? Because we proved that we didn't want nobody else's lands. We, we gave all the uh, Japanese, uh, helped them rebuild. We helped the Germans rebuild. He, uh, Harry Truman was basically one of the worst presidents we've ever had. He never could even qualify to be a businessman because he failed at all of his businesses. Then he finally got into politics and freeloader. Comment on that. Well, you're right. He was a poor businessman and a much better politician. Uh, uh, as to uh, why didn't he declare war on anyone who was trying to build an atomic bomb, I, I think he thought wars were a pretty serious thing. Could he have done something to stop the spread of nuclear weapons? I think that's the point of the question. Well, I am not sure what it could have been. Uh, there was for a time in 1945 and 46 a uh, in an attempt to develop a viable plan for international control of atomic energy. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't think we have time to get into the details of that plan, which became popularly known as the Baruch Plan. Uh, basically, it would have required uh, other countries, primarily the Soviet Union, to, to shut down any development programs that they had uh, and the United States would turn its nuclear facilities over to the United Nations. Uh, the Soviets refused to buy into this plan, uh, and pretty clearly, I think, were intent on developing their own uh, atomic weapons. Uh, after, after that point was reached, uh, the, the genie was indeed out of the bottle. Newtown, Pennsylvania. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I personally had a wonderful meeting with President Truman in 1962. Uh, <clears throat> I learned so many things. I even went to, in town to where his barber was, and I got a haircut at that barber shop. In Independence. But I had, I had been to, um, to uh, Independence on two previous occasions. I, each time I went to his home on Delaware. And um, one day I did happen to see uh, a man working in the yard, and I called to him through the fence. And my conversation with him was, do you ever get to talk to the president? He said, oh, yes, I do. So I, I said to him, well, what do you talk about? And he said, anything the president wants to talk about. But <clears throat> when I went over to... Uh, each time I went to the library, I became acquainted with Mrs. Conway. When I came there the third time, which was, and in between each visit was several months, and she remembered me, and I asked her if the president was there, because the second time when I was there, she said, no, the president and his wife were in Florida. But this particular time, she said, yes, he's in, and I said, oh, I, w I would love to shake hands with the president. She said, I'll go get him. So my wife and I waited, and quite quickly, the president came, gave me a vigorous handshake, welcomed me to the library. Evidently, Mrs. Conway has said this man has been here on various occasions and never had an opportunity to talk with you. But he took me around the library a little bit. Some of the things I remember, this was back in 1962, he was showing me a rifle that had come off of the production line. I think it was one of the very first of the new Garand rifles. And if you recall, he was a captain in the First World War. And um, he told me that the men who were um, used as guides were all people from his old outfit from the First World War. They were there. Here at the, uh, here at the library. At the library. Yeah. All right, sir. Thank you very much for sharing that experience. When you, when you go on a tour of the Delaware House, the National Park Service guides talk to you about the fact that the Trumans were private people and actually uh, that it was sometimes challenging for them about uh, all the people that wanted to come up and talk to them 
at their house. What was life like in those post-presidential years on the privacy issue? Yeah, well, I think Mrs. Truman was considerably more private than Mr. Truman. And uh, I, I, I can easily imagine him coming out to shake hands with someone. Uh, I know I was, I, I never actually met him myself. Uh, he was kind enough to autograph a photo that I once sent in uh, to his office. and. Uh, I was told by uh, someone on the staff, uh, the uh, thing had already been framed and mounted, and they uh, supposed to have said, gee, they, they did such a good job, he hated to take it apart uh, in order to autograph it. Uh, he, uh, he was a gregarious person. He enjoyed meeting people. Uh, Mrs. Truman was, was very private, and uh, I think they, they probably considered their, uh, their home as non-public territory and rather different from uh, the library or from encountering people on the streets. San Francisco, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. My name is Charles Berger. I was a student at Yale in the late 1950s when Truman, former President Truman visited as a Chubb Fellow at the behest of Dean Acheson. He gave seminars and uh, came to our uh, to lecture at our history class, taught by John Morton Blum, a famous historian. And uh, it was a lecture on the presidency. Truman, as has been stated, was an autodidact and considered himself a uh, and was a, an expert on history and the presidency. When he came down into our large history class, more than 200 people were there. He got a standing ovation. He was, as I remember him since a long time ago. He was a very dapper man, dressed, in, I think, in a light, maybe white suit. He walked very quickly with a big smile on his face, went up to the lecture stand, gave us what turned out to be, unfortunately, a rather dull lecture on the presidency. It went something like, uh, first there was Washington, and then there was Adams, and then, then there was Jefferson. He was a good president, etc. Jackson was his favorite president, as I remember. Uh, when he, uh, in spite of that, when he left, he got another standing ovation, and I ran up to him and got an, an autograph, quick autograph from him, and it was one of the thrills of my life because Truman was a wonderful president. Yale at that time was a very, believe it or not, Republican school, and when Adelaide Stevenson had come there in 1956 when I was a freshman, he had come out and gave a, a, a campaign speech. He came out of Woolsey Hall to speak to us who had waited outside to hear him. Somebody threw a tomato at Stevenson, it was a soft tomato, hit him on the hit him on the shoulder, dripped down, dripped down his suit, and Stevenson ran up to the microphone and said, uh, I didn't think it should take a Princeton man to teach Yale men manners. And he turned around and ran away. So my question is, uh, what were the relationships of, uh, of Truman towards uh, Adelaide Stevenson? What did he think of him? And also, if you have time, what was his relationship to Winston Churchill? Uh, well, uh, very quickly on, on your first point, which is, which is intriguing, on, on the Yale visit, he, he loved to talk to students. Uh, someone else has called in and mentioned his visit to Columbia uh, at about the same time and under the same sort of auspices. Uh, I, I remember as a master's student at Columbia in the early 60s uh, hearing one of my professors a very famous political scientist named David B. Truman, no relation to Harry Truman, comment that uh, here was uh, a person with wonderful experience and very little of that got into his speeches which tended to sound as if they'd been lifted from civics textbooks. Uh, I, uh, and, and I got to meet uh, gee, three separate people who were involved in that Yale visit uh, in the course of my research. They all had some wonderful stories about it. Uh, as to Stevenson, he didn't get along well with Stevenson. They were very, very different types. Uh, and they, they just didn't relate to each other, although Truman was instrumental in securing Stevenson the 1952 nomination and had high hopes for him, but uh, very quickly afterwards they had a falling out. Uh, he loved Winston Churchill. They got along famously. Let's introduce you to another person here at the Truman Museum and Library. His name is Clay Bowski, and he's joining us at a part of the exhibit that is devoted to the Marshall Plan. You can see as we're inside the Presidential Library here, as we're uh, walking to where he is, tell us what the Marshall Plan is, Dr. Handy. 
the Marshall Plan is something that uh, is proposed very quickly after the Truman Doctrine. It was a, uh, a comprehensive economic plan for the rehabilitation of post-war Europe. And Clay Bowski, what do you try to do with this part of the exhibit? Well, uh, Susan, we periodically have changing exhibitions on different subjects um, so that people will come back, uh, revisit the library, and be, um, have a chance to see some other materials that they wouldn't normally see in our, in our lo more long-term exhibits. This show is on, the, uh, on George C. Marshall. It's called George C. Marshall, Soldier of Peace. And uh, it's, it was actually put together by the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery and the uh, George Marshall Foundation. And we partnered with them to bring the show here, and it'll be on display into, de in, into December. We've got a couple of portraits uh, to show our audience. We just had a caller who referenced Dean Acheson. Who was he? Uh, Dean Acheson uh, succeeded uh, George Marshall as Secretary of State. And of course, uh, served, uh, Dean Acheson served as Secretary of State during Truman's second term. Uh, and also, uh, it, it's very interesting, even though the two people, Harry Truman and Dean, Dean Acheson, couldn't have been more different uh, in their personalities, they got along very well and developed a very warm friendship, especially uh, after uh, Truman left the presidency. We have in our collection some letters uh, that are uh, in which Dean Acheson just uh, really uh, shows his appreciation of Harry Truman. Another player in the time, Joseph Stalin. You've got a depiction of him that we'll show. If you could talk a little bit about Joseph Stalin. Well, Joseph Stalin, of course, um, uh, as the head of the Soviet Union, um, was allied with the United States during World War II, but during the Truman administration, the relations between the two countries uh, soured, and Joseph Stalin uh, was actually what's interesting is the first time Harry Truman met Joseph Stalin at Potsdam uh, he said that he felt like he was a man that he could deal with well it turned out uh, Harry Truman found out later that uh, Joseph Stalin wasn't a man he could deal with um, uh, Alonzo Hamby what was the Potsdam <coughs> conference we're seeing a picture of it on our screen right now uh, the Potsdam conference occurred in July 1945 uh, just before the use of the atomic bombs against Japan uh, you see the three major figures there Churchill Truman Stalin uh, Churchill replaced by Clement Attlee the new prime minister right at the end of the conference it was basically to discuss the, uh, the post-war, uh, we might almost say, division of Europe uh, uh, and to try to set firm plans for the future on matters like uh, the occupation of Germany, uh, the, uh, uh, the uniting uh, economically to the extent it could be done. It, soon found out that it couldn't be done of uh, the European continent itself. One of the reasons we have a Marshall Plan in 1947 is that very little is agreed on at Potsdam. Let's take a telephone call. We'll come back and talk a little more about the Marshall Plan. Monument, California, uh, Colorado, rather. Good morning. Good morning. Wallace Andrew. I'd like to know about uh, Harry Truman's uh, daughter, Margaret. and um, She's still living, about her family. Second part, General Marshall... Uh, sent by Harry Truman to China to investigate the conflict, civil war, and he came back and said it was a family matter, uh, like a family feud. And uh, would you comment on this, please? Uh, yeah, I, I think we're going to have Margaret Truman on a little later, so I'll, I'll let her speak for herself and uh, talk about China for just a second. It, the future of China was one of the great questions at the end of World War II. It was divided uh, between communist forces led by Mao Zedong and the uh, nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, they were engaged in a civil war. Marshall was sent there to try to mediate it. Uh, it was really a hopeless task, and, and the mission itself may have been somewhat naive, really. Uh, this is sort of like trying to mediate a dispute between a scorpion and a tarantula. Uh, neither side was capable of compromise. Uh, Marshall spent a good part of his in China, came back utterly discouraged, uh, and convinced, I think on the whole rightly, that uh, the 
nationalist government was probably not viable uh, in the long run, uh, and that there was very little the United States could do to affect the course of future events in China. On the Marshall Plan, how uh, receptive was Congress? Uh, the Marshall Plan called for a huge expenditure of money. Uh, you know, we're talking something like $15 billion. And I know that in today's dollars, that's small change. But uh, it was a lot of money uh, at a time when the entire budget of the United States uh, was somewhere around uh, $40 billion, I think, in the immediate post-war years. Uh, so uh, Congress was a little doubtful at first. Uh, a lot of congressmen went to Europe in the winter of 47, 48 to see for themselves, and a lot of them came back converted that, that something had to be done. Uh, and when uh, the communists took over Czechoslovakia in the uh, early months of 1948, and then instituted a blockade of Berlin a few months later, uh, the Marshall Plan was, uh, was set to sail through Congress. One last uh, depiction, one last uh, part of the exhibit from Klebowski is that of uh, General Dwight Eisenhower. We're not looking at it right now. Let's come back to Klebowski and talk about the relationship between General Marshall and also General Eisenhower. Well, um, uh, they were quite different personality types. But if anybody could have been considered uh, George Marshall's protege, it would have been Dwight Eisenhower. And actually, uh, where George Marshall was essentially all business all the time, uh, Dwight Eisenhower could flash his smile and disarm anybody uh, that he was talking to. And that's for, for that reason, uh, in part, was why uh, Eisenhower was chosen to be a supreme uh, Allied commander uh, for the final push in uh, at the end of World War II, because there were so many different uh, factions, uh, the Allies that had to be uh, put together as a team, and uh, Eisenhower was probably the perfect uh, person to do that because he was able to get along with people, um, and he could be very disarming. Well, we're going to say thank you for the explanation of the Marshall Plan in that part of the exhibit, and as you walk to uh, the downstairs portion. We'll uh, say goodbye to you and see you again in a few minutes for another part of the Truman Library exhibit. Okay, be back later. As uh, we lose our guest uh, for a short time, Clay Bowski, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between General Eisenhower and Harry Truman? Uh, it couldn't have been better until the day that Eisenhower uh, declared that he was a Republican and he was going to run for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Uh, and he makes this declaration at the beginning of 1952. Let me ask you if it was anything like all of the speculation we had after the Gulf War um, uh, about uh, the political point of view of the generals there and where they would end up. Uh, Perhaps it was a little different. I think the, uh, the, the key thing here was that uh, Eisenhower was known to be an internationalist. The Republican nomination was likely to go to Robert A. Taft, uh, who was still in 1952 in many ways a, a continental isolationist. Uh, and it was really the, the specter of Taft that convinced Eisenhower that he had to run for president. Uh, the great unknown factor uh, up to that point had been, was Eisenhower a Democrat or a Republican? He was not a registered member of either party. Uh, I think maybe he had not even cast a vote in a presidential election up until that time. Uh, Eisenhower and Truman were rather similar people in, in, in some ways. Uh, they were both uh, uh, very good at meeting strangers and uh, dealing with others. Uh, Clay Bowski uh, quite rightly told us that Eisenhower's great talent was working with other people. Uh, it's, it's, it's Eisenhower who really makes NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, into a functioning organization in 1950 and 51. Uh, Truman admired him enormously. If he'd been a Democrat, Truman would have done everything he could, and he wouldn't have needed to do much of anything to secure the Democratic nomination for him. 
Uh, instead, they have this political falling out, and it winds up with them having quite bitter feelings toward each other. Brian, Texas, for a question on Harry Truman. Yes, good morning, Susan. Good morning. And uh, Dr. Hamby, I wanted to ask you about the 40, 1948 presidential election, particularly the uh, Democratic National Convention of that year. Uh, there were a couple of things that happened at that convention. Of course, the platform committee's minority report that went to the uh, floor of the convention, uh, led by the then mayor of uh, Minneapolis, a fellow by the name of Hubert Horatio Humphrey, and also the walkout of uh, the Mississippi delegation, and I believe it was half of the Alabama delegation. I think there was a, another future presidential contender in the Alabama delegation by the name of George Wallace, who was a circuit judge from a little county down in uh, southeast uh, Alabama. But I wondered if, the, if President Truman had uh, any comments, or had I've never seen anything about his reaction to the walkout of the delegations and, uh, and also his reaction to Humphrey sort of bucking the tide and taking that civil rights plank to the floor. I appreciate your comments, and thank you for the show. Okay, well, uh, Truman had already put himself behind a comprehensive program of civil rights legislation by the time of that convention, and it had been stalled in uh, Congress. For the sake of party unity, he really wanted a uh, bland, one paragraph civil rights platform. So uh, I, I'm sure his, his first reaction is that he's kind of blindsided by Humphrey and the liberals insisting that there has to be something uh, 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 extensive, specific, and very declarative. Uh, as for his reaction to the walk out of the South, uh, he would have preferred quite obviously a united Democratic Party, uh, but uh, he makes his decision that, uh, all right, the Democratic Party's got to stand for civil rights and the South, uh, the South will have to, uh, to go. Uh, in later years, he was quite proud of the fact that he had managed to be reelected president without a united South. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, during the inauguration in, on January 20th, 1949, a good many people noticed that when uh, the car carrying the Dixiecrat nominee, Senator Strom Thurmond, drove by in the parade, uh, President Truman somehow seemed to manage to have an urgent conversation with someone behind him and took no notice of it. Highland, California. Good morning. Morning. Um, I have two questions. One, we have seen snippets uh, on various histories of the White House, and I believe after the refurbishment of the White House, Harry Truman uh, led the first um, tour of the White House, and I wonder how much of that is still extant. The second and probably more important question is about the loyalty oath, uh, either during the McCarthy or precursor to the McCarthy era, it, uh, that uh, Truman instituted, and it seems to be out of character for a man like Harry Truman to have done that. Uh, if you could explain those one of those okay. things, perhaps the curator the other. Thank okay, you. well, well. first of all, yes, you're, you're quite right. He did lead a television tour of the White House after it was rebuilt. Uh, I, I suspect that video is still extant somewhere. Uh, Just a note, how, uh, how long was the renovation process? Oh, gee, it took... Uh, it took at least a couple of years. And where do the Trumans uh, live, if not the White they House? They lived across the street in Blair House. Uh, and it was while uh, uh, they were living in Blair House uh, that in, let's say, I believe it's November 1950, uh, an attempt was made to assassinate Truman by Puerto Rican nationalists. 
The loyalty program uh, is one of the most controversial aspects of the Truman administration. It, it involved much more than loyalty oaths, which frankly have, have not struck me as that big a deal in and of themselves, but uh, it involved at least some cursory investigation into uh, the uh, lives of possibly any federal employee. Uh, it was a program that was set up in early 1947 uh, at a time when Congress was preparing to pass something if the administration uh, did not act. Uh, it was not well thought out. Uh, there are very few people who would say it was a credit to his administration. Uh, I think that Truman always thought that you had to strike some kind of a very difficult balance between the security needs of the country, and certainly there, there were legitimate aspects of the federal government in which loyalty and security were important, uh, on the one hand and individual rights on the other. Uh, the loyalty program, I think most of us would agree today, fell somewhere short of that. Uh, there were certainly some people who were probably unfairly dismissed from the federal government because of it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think some of the writing on it leaves you with the impression that there was a real reign of terror going on in Washington uh, because of that program, and, and that would be a considerable exaggeration also. If you're just joining us, we are Independence, Missouri at the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum talking about the life and times of our 33rd President of the United States. We're going to return to one of the museum exhibits where Clay Bowski, one of the curators here, is uh, standing by. Do you have an answer for that question about Harry Truman's video tour of the White House? Is it uh, still here? Oh, yes. We have a copy of that uh, in our research collection. And uh, it's been uh, broadcast uh, on a few occasions as well. But it's uh, an interesting tour because uh, there were three um, uh, reporters from different networks, uh, and they did a joint pool coverage. And it's very interesting to watch all the heavy equipment moving around the White House and these huge cables and so forth. It's quite a change from today. Even though we have a lot of equipment here. Right. And uh, Harry Truman stopped briefly during that tour in the East Room and played uh, one of the pianos, too. So he had a brief piano concert during that tour as well. Tell us about the exhibit where you are now. Well, I'm standing in, uh, in an exhibit we're quite proud of. Uh, it's uh, uh, the two two 1941 Chrysler automobiles that belong to the Trumans, uh, and we've uh, recently had them uh, restored to their to mint condition. So they're, they now appear exactly as they did when Harry, Harry and Bess bought them uh, in November of 1940. Uh, the car immediately behind me is a 1941 Chrysler Club Coupe. Uh, that was the car that Harry Truman uh, drove most of the time. Uh, and the other car is a 1941 model uh, uh, Chrysler Windsor sedan. And this is the one that uh, Bess Truman used most of the time. One gets the sense, uh, Lon Hamby, that Harry Truman liked cars. Well, he, he did indeed. He loved to drive. Uh, he customarily traveled between Missouri and Washington by driving. Uh, and he was a pretty fast driver, too, because uh, reputedly he could make the drive from Kansas City to Washington, D.C. in two days, which in the... 1930s and early 40s was, was quite a feat, uh, but uh, uh, at one time or another in his early life, he drove over most of the country. Were, were you still able to drive as president at that time? Uh, not really as president, no. And uh, you know, he may have done a little of his own driving on visits home, uh, particularly if he was going out to visit his brother on the farm, but uh, he, he did very little then. He uh, in his post-presidential life, he made one uh, trip by automobile to New York City. He was probably a little old to be behind the wheel on a trip like that. It was uh, uh, stopped, I think it was in Pennsylvania, by uh, the state patrol and given a warning for, uh, I, and I'm not sure if it was excessive speed or a uh, bad lane change or something. Uh, and after that, Bess sort of declared a moratorium on the long-distance driving, but uh, 
He, uh, he still drove himself around Kansas City and Independence quite regularly. And I, I, I must tell you a very quick story uh, regarding a friend of mine who was in graduate school with me and who had been uh, working a part-time job when he was a student in Kansas City at a service station. Uh, the days, of course, before they were self-service. Uh, the other fellow went out to uh, gas up a large Chrysler that had stopped at one of the pumps and came back and said, that was Harry Truman. And uh, my friend said, what did he say? He said, fill her up, what do you think? And of course, David McCullough, another Truman biographer, uh, tells the story of that trip across the country in the post-presidency yeah. with people speeding up and slowing down to make sure if that really was Harry Truman in the car next to them on the highway. Let's take our next telephone call. As we do, uh, Clay Bowski once again is going to be walking from that part of the museum, and we'll see him in a few minutes at a part uh, of an exhibit called Dear Bess. Next, Rochester, Minnesota. Hi, good morning. Are you Go there? ahead. Yes. Hi. Hey, my name is Sean Kettlecamp, and I live in Rochester, Minnesota. I just uh, wrote a book called uh, Chatty Cathy and Her Talking Friends. It's the history of the Mattel toy company in the 1960s, but previous to that I had consulted on two books on White House history in the early 1990s, um, having to do with the 200th anniversary of the laying of the cornerstone of the White House, and it's interesting um, with the restoration of the White House, one of the interesting things I thought was that President Tr Truman apparently had the state dining room mantle from Teddy Roosevelt's administration declared unusable so that he could have it there at his museum. In her famous restoration, had asked him if she could have it back. She wanted to redo uh, the state dining room, and he told her no. <laughs> and. Uh, so she had to have a reproduction made in marble, which is there in the White House now. But uh, uh, several people from even the curator's office at the White House have said that it's not on display even at the museum. Uh, do you know anything about that? Clay Bowski, can you answer that question? Do you know about that? I sure can. It, uh, it actually is on display, and it's in our uh, exhibit, Dear Bess. And, uh, and in a few minutes, we'll be able to take a look at that mantle. Um, the uh, mantle, that story is, uh, is almost correct. Um, the mantle was replaced in the White House uh, uh, during the Kennedy administration by a uh, slightly smaller copy uh, carved out of marble. The original is made out of a, a limestone, that's, uh, and it's, uh, when, when we do get a picture of it, you'll see that it's uh, much yellow, yellower than the, uh, than the one that's in the White House today. Let's take a call from Petaluma, California. Yes. Uh, when I was a student at Berkeley and during the loyalty oath uh, crisis, my family was avid Republicans, and every night at the dinner table we heard negative things about Truman, and only one negative call have I heard today. I, I'm trying to write a paper. I became uh, tremendously interested in Democrats, even though the loyalty oath thing um, became a Democrat before I left Berkeley. When, in the 60s, Truman did a series of lectures on Saturday night. They were fantastic. And I remember uh, him talking to, uh, he said, about, about MacArthur. He had called Marshall in, or Marshall had gone to him when McCarthy was fired. And uh, when, when Marshall heard all of the stories, he said, why hadn't you fired this before? And could you please tell us, are those lectures still available? Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, the, the Berkeley loyalty oath controversy would have involved a, a, a state law. Of course, it's a very famous controversy with uh, national ramifications. Uh, the Saturday night lectures, I, I believe you're thinking of, probably involve a TV documentary that was made with uh, Truman as sort of an MC. It was, uh, I believe it was a 26-part series on his presidency. Uh, made in, in, in the early 60s, and uh, yes, those, those are all here at the Truman Library. Columbia, Missouri. Good morning. Glad to be on. Uh, I think I'm one of the lucky people who survived because Harry Truman 
went to go ahead and use the atomic bomb. I was in the military at that time, and I undoubtedly would have been over in the Pacific and maybe even had to go to Japan. So from my point of view, I think it was a wonderful thing. Uh, the first election I can remember is when, Her when Franklin Roosevelt ran against Herbert Hoover. Well, that gives you an idea how old I am. <laughs> uh, and another thing that's interesting, even when Harry Truman used the atomic bomb, I had no idea what I would be doing with the rest of my life. I finally wound up working in the nuclear weapons industry for 32 years, and so I know a little bit about it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, as an older American, I feel Harry Truman was the last good president we had. Those that follow Harry Truman, I think, are a dime a dozen. And I really am disappointed in some of the people we've had in our political leadership in the last years. But under our system of government, anybody can run for the job if you have enough money, have enough friends, and talk a good talk, why well, then you can wind up being our leader. I appreciate C-SPAN and all they do for us as citizens. Thank you very much for your program. Uh, just let me say there, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people like the caller who were in the armed forces scheduled for duty in the Pacific uh, in the summer of 1945 who feel their lives were saved by the atomic bomb. Uh, some of them are undoubtedly correct. Uh, Exactly how many, of course, we'll, we'll never know because uh, we'll never know uh, how many lives would have been lost in an invasion of Japan. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll never know how long such an invasion would have taken. Uh, and we can't be 100% sure that it, was, uh, that it would have been necessary. Conceivably, Japan would have collapsed. Uh, but we do know that the Japanese military leaders thought they could defend Japan and thought they could inflict tremendous casualties. We haven't yet talked very much about Bess Wallace. How did he meet her? Uh, he first met her in Sunday school when they were five, uh, when she was five years old, I, I believe. And uh, Am I right that they didn't marry until the age of 34 and 35, respectively? That's right, yeah, in 1919. And uh, uh, it's quite remarkable. She, she really appears to have been the only woman in his life that he ever had uh, serious romantic feelings about. Uh, one, of the, one of the hard questions for a biographer to deal with has been uh, this, this whole issue of a period in the early 20th century, from the time he graduates from high school, uh, until they start to see each other again, in nine, uh, about 1910 and, and 1911, uh, they, they really see each other rarely, if at all. Uh, he's doing a number of things, working at some jobs in Kansas City, then uh, going back uh, down to help his father manage uh, uh, a farm uh, the farm at Grandview that belonged to uh, Grandmother Young and to one of, uh, uh, one of Harry's uncles. For this period of maybe nine years, they're, they're separated, but uh, uh, he, he never got over her. Uh, she was the only woman in his life. Uh, it's quite a neo-Victorian romance story. Klebowski, one of the ways researchers can learn about the relationship between Harry and Bess Truman through Harry Truman's letters, and you are now at an exhibit called Dear Bess. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Um, of all the collections we have at the Truman Library, possibly one of the most unique uh, is certainly the collection of letters that Harry wrote to Bess over the years. Uh, we have more than 1,300 of these letters in our collection, and they're handwritten, and they span the years from uh, 1910 until uh, the late 50s. And it's just a remarkable uh, correspondence. And what's even more remarkable is that Bess saved all, the, all these letters, and uh, we ended up with them. And we've, we've tried to highlight them in this exhibition, uh, Dear Bess, Love Letters from the President. And we selected examples of letters uh, from 1911 through 1957. You've got some you want to read for us. Yes, uh, this, this particular letter here is what I call the icon letter of this show. Each year on their anniversary, uh, uh, Harry would write to Bess um, 
uh, a, a love letter, and this is, this is a one-page love letter that he wrote to her in 1948 on their anniversary. It says, Dear Bess, 29 years seems like 29 days, and then he outlines uh, what they did in their years, their, including their honeymoon and, and so forth, up through his career as a, as a haberdasher and a county judge. Uh, and you know, vice president and president, and then he concludes by saying, "You are still on the pedestal where I placed you that day in Sunday school in 1890. What an old fool I am!" Did Bess Truman write back? Uh, Bess did write back, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, almost all of her letters are lost or gone. Um, I, we don't know why. Maybe uh, Harry Truman didn't feel like saving them as much as uh, she felt like saving his. Uh, but we do have a few of those on display uh, in the show as well, some of her letters to him. But, you know, we suspect that she ended up writing to him virtually every time that he wrote to her. So uh, at some point, at one point, there would have been probably as many letters from Bess as there are from Harry. If you had, or you could, characterize overall what he tried to do with his letters, how did he use them? Well. Uh, I think what you can say is that he was, he was much more comfortable um, writing a letter than he was speaking. Uh, he, could, he could pour out his feelings a lot better in writing, and you see that through the letters. Um, but uh, the thing that really, I think, surprises visitors is, is he'll move from one sentence where he's talking about uh, his duties of state, you know, talk, meeting with Joseph Stalin or whatever, and the very next sentence he'll talk about the uh, cost of uh, the seat covers for the for the car that she's trying to pick out, and so the way the letters go back and forth from these great world events to just very very personal day-to-day uh, -day correspondence is very interesting. The thing, the one thing that people do need to know is that uh, during the White House years, and in fact during all of Harry Truman's political career, um, Bess spent a lot of time here in Independence while Harry was in Washington, and that's why there are so many letters. Is uh, is that for a good part of the year they were separated uh, while she was back here and he was in Washington. You have another letter you can read to us? Well, I have several, uh, but uh, this one is one that I think is particularly nice. This is the last letter we feature in the show, and it's another one of those anniversary letters. And what's very interesting about this, this is on their 38th anniversary, and all he did was just simply list every year of their marriage and for each year, he would highlight uh, something important that happened during that year. And uh, the other thing that's sort of interesting about this is on some of those years when he was president uh, and incredibly important things were happening around the world, the thing that he will note uh, in his letter as an important event was very, tended to be very personal. I saw two citations, out of a job and still out of a job. So right. they had some rough years as yeah, well. Yeah, there were some rough years in the 20s. We're going to take a telephone call as you walk to another letter that you'd like to show us. Hermiston, Oregon, you're on the air. Good morning. Good I'd morning, like to sir. tell you how I was affected by President Truman. We were in the 473rd Regimental Combat Team in Italy in July of 45, and they sent us home for 45 days of leave. At the end of 45 days, the war in Japan was over. And so I got to thank him personally when he was on his campaign trail when they pulled his car into Oakland Army Base, and there was about six master sergeants supplementing the military police, and out comes this man walking by, and he said, What are you doing here, Sergeant? I said, Well, President, I came to thank you about ending the war. And with that, he smiled, shook my hand, and I never had a chance for an autograph. But believe me, it saved many, many lives when he ended the war with the atomic bombs. And I really appreciate a gentleman like that. Thank you for your call. Let's return to the Dear Bess exhibit, learning more about the relationship between Harry and Bess Truman. What else do you have for us? Well, we have uh, a couple of letters that I think are very interesting. Uh, during the White House years, um, uh, Harry Truman wrote some very interesting letters to Bess, including this one, which he wrote in June, early June of 1945. Now, this is only a couple months after he became president, and it's exactly two months before the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan. But he's just writing to Bess about 
organizing the office and so forth, and he's, he's trying to get the cabinet straightened out. But there's a very interesting passage in this. He says, it won't be long until I can sit back and study the whole picture and tell them what is to be done in each department. When things come to that stage, there will be no more to this job than there was to running Jackson County, and not any more worry. Um, and this is, this is early on in the presidency, and, and he's very confident that he'll be able to uh, get the government organized and move along. Well, we all know that uh, things just didn't turn out that easy. Well, and Hebby, in, in your book, you uh, talk about his, uh, uh, may I characterize it as naivete, going into the office about the size and scope of the job, when some of the clips we've shown later on, he talks about how difficult sure. the job was. Sure. Uh, I... I think, uh, of course, I'm very familiar with that particular line that Clay just read, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it's quite naivete or maybe just uh, wishful thinking on the part of a person who's, who's been thrust into this overwhelming responsibility and he's, he's trying to deal with it and trying to be as optimistic as possible. Because uh, when you read that line, you tell yourself, he really must have known better, didn't he? Uh, he'd been around Washington for over 10 years at that point. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a little hard to explain, but he, uh, he writes it. He's, he's obviously hoping for the best. Or reassuring a worrying family. Yeah. How, what was Bess's reaction when he was sworn in as president? Uh, well, I, I'm sure her first reaction was shock, as it was with everyone on Roosevelt's death, because... No, no one really knew how precarious the president's health was at that time. Uh, beyond that, I, I think it'd be fair to say that she was generally uncomfortable with the role of first lady and all the, uh, the unwelcome public attention that it brought her. Uh, in her uh, first year as First Lady. She's, she's asked uh, by Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, for example, to resign from the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, a membership that uh, she really cherished because the, uh, the DAR had a, uh, an accurate and well-deserved reputation as being rather hostile to civil rights and to black people. Uh, she she didn't resign. She didn't think that that was uh, a part of her obligations, but uh, uh, she wound up being called the last lady in the land for, uh, uh, for that decision. So it was, it was tough for her. Clay Belsky, what else do you have there? Well, um, uh, we talked a little earlier about the uh, renovation of the White House that took place during Truman's administration, and we had one caller who, talk, who called in about the uh, the mantle from the state dining room in the White House. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get a shot of that, but that's also on the display. There we go. That's the, uh, this is the uh, mantle from the state dining room in the White House, and it was removed along with about 30 other mantles from the White House uh, during the renovation. Uh, and the reason it was removed was that it was uh, uh, thought that, uh, that they would return the White House to the look it had originally when it was built. And this mantle was installed in 1902 by uh, Theodore Roosevelt. It's called the Buffalo Mantle. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's uh, a limestone and fairly yellow. And the, the replacement for it was a, a white marble mantle that was put in during the Kennedy administration. Between the times of the White House renovation and the Kennedy administration, there was a black, a very simple mantle installed that was supposed to replicate what they thought might have been in the White House the first originally. Of these 30 mantles, or there may have been 32, but of the many mantles that were removed from the White House, they were all uh, donated to uh, nonprofit organizations around the country, so our caller wasn't quite right about that part of the story. Um, but also during the renovation and before the renovation, a letter that we have on display here that, that I think is very interesting, uh, Harry and Bess Truman carried on this banter in their letters about the noises that were, the White House uh, was making and because it was essentially collapsing on itself. Uh, it was structurally unsound. And uh, uh, in one of the letters, uh, they started joking about the ghosts in the White House. And this, this letter is particularly nice. Uh, Harry is writing this letter to Bess. I sit here in this old house and work on foreign affairs, read reports, and work on speeches, all the while listening to the ghosts walk, and, walk up and down the hallway and even right here in the study. 
the floors pop and the drapes move back and forth. I can just imagine old Andy and Teddy having an argument over Franklin, or James Buchanan and Franklin Pierce deciding which was the more useless to the country. And when Mildred Fillmore and Chester Arthur join in for place and show, the din is almost unbearable. But I still can get some work done. Thank you for that. Appreciate uh, your help in learning more about Harry Truman through the exhibits you have here at the Library and Museum. You're welcome. Clay Baski, curator. One of the things that's important to us in this series is to allow you who are teaching in the classroom to have access to as much material on videotape as possible so that you can teach your students about the American presidents. We have teacher kits available with lesson plans in them, and there's two ways to access them. You can do it online at cspan.org backslash classroom, or you can telephone this number, 202-626-4858, and talk to people in our C-SPAN education unit to uh, learn more about teaching with American presidents. The number again is 202-626-4858. And in each one of our American presidents series uh, programs, we have been introducing you to a teacher who uh, teaches in the classroom about the presidents. Joining us by telephone is Francis Bailey Wood, who is a middle school math and history teacher at St. Paul's Episcopal Day School in Kansas City, Missouri. Francis Wood, you have uh, a chance to teach with materials from this library. Can you explain about it? I certainly can, and, and let me say it's a pleasure to visit with you again. Um, we were fortunate to be um, pilot school five years ago for the Truman Foot Locker Project. It's just a wonderful, interactive, hands-on learning experience. So we're also very fortunate to have our own Truman trunk, thanks to the Truman Library. But I am told that the Truman Library will loan a trunk to school for two weeks as long as you can go pick it up. And, and it's certainly a wonderful value. It's free, uh, a great educational um, benefit. We Our, have some vid video on the screen we're showing of you with uh, some of the artifacts inside the trunk. How's it work? Well, yes, our trunk uh, looks like the one that was issued to Captain Harry Truman during World War I, and it's filled with his eyeglasses, different types of hats that Biff and Harry might have worn, several newspapers with major headlines, campaign buttons, piano music, other articles that helped to tell a story about some aspect of Harry Truman's life. And what we did was have uh, each student select an object to research. They used the American President's Truman Library website, Project Crystal Sop. Um, they could actually view things like one of Harry's letters to Beth, Harry's speeches, look at photographs, just wonderful opportunities you know, for learning. And, after their research was complete, they uh, wrote a speech. They took on the character of a person who knew Truman and then wrote their speech about that item. For instance, one student was Truman's piano teacher, and she told about his love for music, and another student was Harry's brother, Vivian, and he told about life on the Grandview Farm. We just had a lot of fun dressing in costume and presenting the speeches to parents and other students. What do you think your, your students learned? They learned about Harry Truman as a man, as a family man, um, his love for Beth, they commented on the many letters that he had written. They learned about his life as a president, uh, about, uh, backtrack here, his uh, life as a captain of Battery D in World War I. And um, also, uh, we talked some about his post-presidential activities. Why do you think it's important to teach about presidents? Well, you know, I think students relate to personalities more than facts, and so we try to make these personalities, presidential personalities, come alive. For instance, when I introduced the Harry Truman unit, I read Harry Four Eyes to them. It's a very easy read-aloud book, but the students, especially the ones that wear glasses, but all students immediately relate to young Harry and his problems of not being able to see. And we think that if you use the presidents as a starting place, this really helps the student to learn about the president's period of time. And we like to use lots of learning experience. As a matter of fact, I was amazed when I made a list. <laughs> I was preparing for this interview and made a list. We, we used uh, many disciplines, reading, creative writing, note-taking, research, speaking, computer activities, use of the Internet, videos, creative projects such as posters, field trips, speakers. Um, at St. Paul's, we just use whatever is worthwhile and will enhance the educational process because we want to appeal to the strengths and the interests of many students. What ages are your students? Uh, in middle school, um, 
I have seventh grade American history, and the other um, history teacher has sixth and eighth grade. And uh, do you know if the Truman Trunk is available to other teachers around the country? Um, when I called to check on that, because I, I felt like we would probably get some questions about that, I was told that um, any teacher could take a trunk for two weeks as long as someone could pick it up and take it back and, and that uh, there was no fee for that. Well, we uh, would encourage teachers who are interested in learning more to call the Truman Library and Museum and find out about the teacher trunk program. Frances Bailey Wood, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'm glad we could show you in the classroom with the students using the materials in the trunk. And thank well, you for talking to us. It's certainly been a privilege to be a part of the American President series. Thank you so much. Glad to have you here. Well, she talked about the various materials that she uses to teach with the presidents. And as part of this series, we have uh, all kinds of materials available as well. Uh, not free, but pretty close to it. For example, one of the materials is this tote bag with all the names of the presidents uh, that are available, all their signatures on it. You'll learn about this and other materials from American presidents during our break. And after our break, we'll be back to learn more about Harry Truman, president number 33. I want to say goodbye and thanks for your help. I want to talk with you a little about what has happened since I became your president. I am speaking to you from the room where I have worked since April 1945. This is the president's office in the west wing of the White House. And this is the desk where I have signed most of the papers that embodied the decisions I have made as president. It has been the desk of many presidents and will be the desk of many more. The president is required to put in long hours, usually 17 hours a day with no payment for overtime. I sign my name on the average of 600 times a day and see and talk to hundreds of people every month, shake hands with thousands every year and still carry on the business of the largest going concern in the world. There is no job like it on the face of the earth. In the power which is concentrated here at this desk and in the responsibility and difficulty of the decisions, I want all of you to realize how big a job, how hard a job it is, not for my sake, because I'm stepping out of it, but for the sake of my successor. He needs the understanding help of every citizen. It is not enough for you to come out once every four years and vote for a candidate and then go back home and say, well, I've done my part, now let the new president do the worrying. He can't do the job alone. In a moment, we'll continue our live discussion looking into the life of Harry S. Truman. But first, President Truman's remarks at the 1948 Democratic National Convention. In 1932, we were attacking the citadel of special privilege and greed. We were fighting to drive the money changers from the temple. Today, in 1948, we are now the defenders of the stronghold of democracy and of equal opportunity. The haven of the ordinary people of this land and not of the favored classes or the powerful few. The battle cry is just the same now as it was in 1932. And I paraphrase the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt as he issued the challenge in accepting his nomination at Chicago. This is more than a political call to arms. Give me your help, not to win votes alone, but to win in this new crusade and keep America secure and safe for its own people. <clears throat> Now, my friends, with the help of God and the wholehearted push which you can put behind this campaign, we can save this country from a continuation of the 80th Congress and from misrule from now on. I must have your help. You must get in and push and win this election. The country can't afford another Republican Congress.
Uh, well, from, uh, from the time that they were married in 1919 until his death at the end of 1972. And then she lived on in that house on Delaware Street uh, for a number of years, and then it was turned over to the people of the American um, public, really, and you can go on tour there and also visit this museum and library in Independence, Missouri, if you're interested in more about the life of Harry Truman, our 33rd president. We're taking your telephone calls during this segment about Harry Truman, and the C-SPAN phone numbers are on the screen right now, 624-1111 with a 202 area code if you live in the eastern half of the U.S., and 202-624-1115 if you live in the mountain or Pacific time zones. And we'd appreciate your telephone calls and your questions about Harry Truman. Let's take one from Atlanta. Hello. You're on the air. I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is... In 1947, when the crash in Roswell, New Mexico took place, did uh, President Truman know about that? Are there writings about it? And what were his comments about the crash and uh, the change in opinion from the government it's from a uh, uh, saucer crash to a uh, weather balloon? And my second question is, we hear about the, um, you know, the dropping the bombs in Japan and everything, but did he languish over that? Was it like a Kennedy thing with a Cuban Missile Crisis? Was there, you know, we don't hear about the human part of him. You know, what was the human factor about dropping those bombs? And did, did it haunt him after he left the office? And, um, you know, was the decision-making very tough? And when did he actually know that we had that kind of power? Thanks very much, Atlanta. Uh, well, we, we've managed to talk about the bombs a bit. I, I think he had no hesitation in uh, ordering them dropped, in part because... He had had a military career, which he had seen some difficult service in World War I. He had, uh, he had seen the dead bodies of American servicemen stacked up alongside roads. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful picture of him as an artillery captain on screen now, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think he very much regretted that a lot of non-military people had to be killed with the deployment of the atomic bomb. Uh, but this was war as it had developed in World War II. Uh, as to Roswell, I, I have not a clue. Uh, sorry, Southfield, Michigan, you're on the air. Yes, good morning. I'm Keith Reinbert of Southfield, Michigan. I have a couple of comments and a question. Um, first, I'd like to say hello to my sister, Tanja, her husband, Aaron, and their son, Edward. And they live in Lee Summit, Missouri which is only about a 20-minute drive from Truman's house. Um, and back in the spring of this year, um, I visited my sister, and we drove by the Truman house, and we were very surprised that it was a rather, um, it was a very modest house, frankly, and we were quite surprised about that. Um, but I have a great deal of interest in uh, historical architecture. I wanted to know if we were going to get a look on the inside of the house and if there are any significant um, features on the inside of the house that you may be able to comment on. And I'll hang no up and hear your, your Thank phone. you. No cameras allowed inside. Uh, which is a shame. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I think people would be very interested in seeing the interior of that house. It is a very nice, large, old house, but the overwhelming impression that you have is that the Trumans were people who lived very modestly, uh, certainly for a, a person who was uh, a U.S. senator, president, former president of the United States. Palisades, Washington. Hello? You're on the air. I can hardly hear you. We can hear you just fine. What's your question? Uh, uh, I, it's not a question, because, uh, but uh, I flew in Harry Truman's uh, inaugural parade, and, and uh, I was flying a seaplane. And I told my co-pilot that when we started in on the, uh, to fly over, I was going to go back and man the relief tube. Uh, most men know what a relief tube is in an airplane, a military airplane. And we uh, started in, and it was so rough, I didn't dare, I just felt I couldn't let the co-pilot fly the plane. He later went with one of the airlines and made far more money in a year than I made in almost my entire naval career. But uh, uh, I wanted to come back and say that I'd taken care of the old rascal. Like most people my age, uh, I think we all think Truman was a, a, a fine president, although 
uh, being a good Republican, I was much opposed to his domestic policies. Thank you for your call, sir. Cape Cod, Massachusetts, on Harry Truman. Hi, I have a question and a comment. My comment turn down is... The turn down the volume on your TV. We're getting feedback. Sorry. I would like to know, um, when Eisenhower didn't defend Marshall with, when, from McCarthy's charges, what happened to Marshall? And didn't, wasn't that a, 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 um, a, a point for the falling out with Eisenhower and Truman? And one of the um, comment is, I think Harry Truman is, was a great president. He exemplifies honesty. When you think of Truman, you think of honesty in the common man. And I think along with FDR and him following that, those 20 years, plus actually with the Eisenhower years, cemented us in uh, they're, they're all three of them great presidents. Thank you. Uh, in in uh, 1951 and 1952, Senator Joe McCarthy had made some rather general charges against uh, Marshall, particularly Marshall's career as Secretary of State and uh, his involvement in the China negotiations as being a communist dupe. Uh, Eisenhower had initially planned to respond to that in the 1952 campaign during a uh, speech in Wisconsin, but uh, decided to delete that passage. Uh, that certainly contributed to the falling out between Truman and Eisenhower, although I, I suspect there would have been a falling out anyhow, but it, uh, Truman did feel very keenly about that omission. Uh, as for Marshall, well, uh, I, I can't say that he was really hurt by any of this. He went on to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. After our next call, Margaret Truman. Next call is Las Vegas. Uh, good morning. Uh, up until, uh, up until, until 1945-46, I was in the military, and I never thought about presidents much as being no more than figureheads. But as a black American soldier servant, he... Uh, issued the executive order to uh, no more discrimination against black soldiers. My question is, uh, did he do that on his own, or, or was, he just, was it just him? I mean, uh, was it other people who uh, advised him? Thank you. Were you still in the military at the time of the order? Yes, I sure was. And what was the effect? Oh, the effect was, for me, was, uh, and the other black soldiers were great. I mean, it's just like being freed. Can you tell us uh, what the reaction was among other troops? Well, uh, among black soldiers, it was it was great, but uh, it was a little apprehensions because of the past past uh, presidents that most units didn't want to accept black soldiers into their units. So and, did uh, you did you receive new assignments after the executive order that integrated oh, you with other so, with other white soldiers? Oh yes, and I'll never forget it. I was on the bus heading for a white unit, and the first sergeant saw us on the bus and he started raising his hand and said, hey, you know, you don't come here, go someplace else. And it was a while before the thing took hold and uh, I don't know how much President Eisenhower supported it, but uh, I hear he wasn't too, uh, too supportive of, of the idea. Thank you for your call. You uh, referenced it earlier, but could you talk a little bit more about the executive order to integrate the military? Uh, this, this occurs in the summer of 1948, and uh, it occurs right after the Dixiecrat walkout at the National Convention, as a matter of fact. Truman had already proposed a rather broad-gauged civil rights program. Uh, I think he felt that uh, if, uh, if the Dixiecrats were going to leave, if he was going to lose a substantial proportion of the anti-civil rights forces, uh, then he should move ahead with this business of... Uh, desegregating the military, which, which had been kicked around for some time. It's an issue that goes back to World War II uh, when, when little was done. Uh, it did take uh, oh, a couple of years and the pressure of the Korean War for, for reasonably full implementation. Uh, Eisenhower had opposed it in the years immediately after World War II. Uh, but uh, was well along by the time he became president, and uh, he carried it through. Uh, I, I think it's, it's worth saying just uh, very quickly about uh, Truman's personal attitudes. Uh, one has to remember that he was raised in an environment that was rather southern. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, 
independence was sort of a uh, uh, sort of a northernmost outpost of the upper south so uh, this, this wasn't like Mississippi by any means but uh, it was still southern uh, he was surrounded with southern attitudes about race uh, for most of his early life uh, and I'm not sure he shook those off a hundred percent but on the other hand he uh, he did have, in my estimate, a genuine belief in the principle of equal opportunity uh, and a uh, belief that people of any color should have a chance to do as much with their lives as they could. Joining us by telephone right now is Margaret Truman Daniel. She is a successful writer of mystery stories and lives in New York City, the mother of uh, four sons. And again, joining us by telephone, Mar Margaret Truman Daniel, thank you. We've been at it for two hours now with questions from all around the country about your father. What would you most like our audience to know about him? Well, I don't know a lot of things, I suppose. Uh, they were a very happy couple, my mother and father. <clears throat> they got along very well. I've never heard them quarrel, ever. Mother would disagree with a few things once in a while, but it was never an argument about much of anything. And that picture, whoo, that's when we were beginning to go to Washington that you have on film there. What was it like, uh, maybe you can talk about the decision inside the family when your father uh, decided to seek the Senate and uh, moving himself to a national stage. Obviously things were going to change for the Trumans. I don't remember any discussion at all. The only thing that bothered me was that I was going to a different uh, city and I was going to have to leave a lot of my friends. I didn't like that, but after a year or two, I got used to it. We've seen that your parents were prolific writers. Do you think that influenced your direction in your career? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Dad did love to write letters, and I don't like to write letters. I'd rather use the telephone. And he never quite understood that because he didn't like the telephone very much. So we never quite solved that. One of the other interests that you shared is music. Can you talk a little bit about it? We really haven't talked about his, his uh, love of the piano. Well, he's played the piano very well, especially Mozart and Chopin. But the thing is, when I was about five or six years old, he taught me to play simple duets with him. And from then on, I began to study the piano. And how much an influence was music on your life? Well, quite a bit, because I was a concert singer for about, oh, I suppose, 15 years. And then I was in a lot of television and radio, and uh, then I started writing books. What was all of the public attention like for you as a young woman and young adult? It didn't have much, I would say. It wasn't very Im impressive at all. I was in school. I was in George Washington University. I graduated in four I went with mother and dad on some of the official trips that we made. I think the most interesting one was the one we, when we went to Brazil, and we, it was the first international monetary conference after the war. It was fascinating to me, of course, first of all, to be in Brazil, and also to re, go to all of the meetings and see what was going on. How much traveling did you do with them, in general? Well, I traveled with them all the time. I, I certainly was on that 48 campaign train for a long, long time. <laughs> that was quite a long trip. Actually, how many, it was two different trips. How many miles do you think you covered? Well, I think we covered all the states, one way or another. Was your father and your mother certain that he would win despite the polls in 48? We both were. Mother and I were both sure he would win. You had to look at the size of the people who came out to listen to him. There were a lot of them. I mean, it got bigger and bigger as we went further west. But we didn't have much money. I remember the Senator Bob Kerr in Oklahoma put up $50,000 just to get us out of the station. So when I read about these mountainous sums of money today, I rather agree with uh, a Republican, Senator McCain, that there ought to be a limit. I, um, I've been told that you wouldn't mind taking a couple of telephone calls. Can you take some from our audience? Sure. Okay, let's... I used to have a program where I did nothing but take phone calls. Well, let's listen to a question from Sutherland, Oregon. 
Does Margaret remember what color she painted the kitchen in her home in, in Independence? Light green. And why was that? Mother liked the color, and she thought it would be a good idea to have the whole thing light green. So one summer I painted it. And it's still that way today, isn't it? As far as I know. <laughs> I've been there for a while. How, how often do you come back to Independence? Well, I used to come back every year. I haven't been back now for a few years because I had a little difficulty, but uh, I'll be back there soon again. Next call is from New York City. Good morning. I was Good morning. in high school in 1947, and you were just talking about the Dewey defeat. But I'd like to talk, and that was the first time Mr. Truman ran for office. I'd like to uh, comment and ask a question why he didn't run for a second term. Now, if I remember correctly, the decision to fire General MacArthur, although correct uh, from a narrow point of view, that is civilian authority over military, is accurate. But uh, number one, I think that uh, MacArthur's firing was very unpopular. Number two, I remember the frustration with the Korean War. It was a little like Vietnam. We weren't winning. And number three, a lot of people suspected, because of these circumstances, which wasn't necessarily true, that the Democrats were soft on communism. So that Margaret Truman, Daniel, let's get a, a response, caller. I Thanks. Think Could the you? Professor should respond to that. All right. Well, I. Uh... I think the caller's memories are all quite correct on, on these scores. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the softness on communism business is quite unfortunate. We're, I, we're, after all, fighting a war in Korea to avoid the spread of communism, so it, it seems kind of strange, but yeah, that, that perception was out there in those days. Next call's from Bethany, Oklahoma. Yes, my name's David Nippers, and uh, I have a letter that President Truman wrote to A.J. Knob, and A.J. Knob was in uh, World War I with Harry Truman, and I was wondering if I could just read that. You could read a brief portion of it, please. Okay. Well, it's real short. It says, you don't know how much I appreciate your kind letter of congratulations, and this is when Harry Truman became a senator. It's like old times to get a letter from you. It recalls our days in France. I ho only hope indeed you will keep in touch with me in the future, and there's no excuse now. You only have to put down Washington, D.C. I was wondering if Mr. Hamby had any stories about President Truman in World War I. Well, thanks. Actually, could we ask Margaret uh, Truman Daniel about her father's war career? His war career? Well, I and, only know from what I heard. Uh, and, and that's what the caller's he... interested in, some stories. Well, he, of course, he didn't talk about it very much. He wrote a series of books that were published at that time, and they were mostly pictures. And uh, half the time he refused to let me look at them. He said they were too horrible. He didn't want me to see them. And, but I remember those books vividly. When he wasn't looking, I used to sneak looks at them to see what it was all about. And it was horrible. He was right. Dr. Hamby? I, I think uh, Harry Truman's World War I experience was very important to him. Uh, he was uh, a very good artillery captain. Uh, he was in some life-threatening situations that he handled very well. And he, he came out of the war, I think, with more confidence in himself than he had ever had and with the realization that he had the stuff to be a leader of men. Juno, Alaska. Hello? You're on the air. Hello? Sir, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's two things I wanted to mention. The first thing about his military service, as I understand it, that when he went down to the uh, draft board, whatever it was there, he had a bad eyesight, and so in order to get into the service, he memorized the eye chart. So he, when he got down to take the test, he passed it. And another thing I wanted to talk about is... Uh, during when he was a senator, they were investigating the war profiteers who were taking 5% off on these uh, contracts they had. It was a, a list of graph, waste, and product 
deficiencies and brought him public praise. And as I understand, it was around $15 billion at that time they were able to collect from these uh, war plants and all that. So if you can comment on that, I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Margaret Truman Daniel, would you talk about your father's eyesight? Yes, sir. Well, he had bad eyes. He was born with bad eyes. And I think that story about him memorizing the chart may be apocryphal, but it probably might not. It might be true. I don't know. But the thing about it, that he never took part in sports was not because of his glasses. He didn't really care much for sports. <laughs> so that uh, confused my mother a little bit when I turned out to be like him because she was a demon tennis player. And, of course, he, she liked to fish, and uh, he would bait the hook for her and sit there and read a book while she fished. They got along very well, although they were very different personalities. And how long was it before he realized that eyesight was a problem and got glasses? He didn't. His, his mother, my grandmother Truman did. It was the 4th of July, and there were a lot of fireworks and everything, and he was paying no attention to them because he couldn't see them. She realized that so she had a problem she, with her son. She took him oh. to a doctor in Wichita, and he said this boy has, I think they called it in those days, they called it flat eyeballs. I believe it's like myopia. I don't know what that is being fortunate and having good eyesight. But they, uh, he started wearing glasses when he was about seven or eight years old. You referenced books. How important were books to Harry Truman? Oh, he read and read and read. I mean, he, if he didn't have a book, he usually had four or five books at one time. He would keep them by his side on a table, and he would pick up one and read, oh, 50 or 60 pages of it, put it down, pick up another one. And he never lost the continuity. Now, I can do that with two but not with five. Had you begun your writing career when he was still alive? No, no, that came later. Well, I went, one thing is, you see, I've written not only mysteries, but I've written a book about him and about mother, right. and also about first ladies. They're not just all mysteries. Yes, I know that. One about I've read, him. Uh, read several of the mysteries, so that was most on my mind. <laughs> see, well, uh, thank you. Let, uh, let he, me ask you, sorry. No, he, he just, uh, he really read, so many books and about all manner of things, subjects. And he was, he was a very well-read man. Would you talk about your mother's life after your father passed away? Well, she was really lost. She stayed in the house, and she, she lived to be 97. And, but she, I think she, when she came to Washington, we had to go to Washington for three or four years, my husband was put in charge of the New York Times Bureau there. And she came to have Christmas with us and with her grandchildren. But she always went home the day before he died. He, he didn't die the day after Christmas. I think it was the 28th. And, but she was gone, but then she went back home. She wouldn't stay with us any longer. What, was it a difficult decision in the family to turn the Delaware Street House over to the federal government? Well, no, because the Internal Revenue Service wanted a million dollars from me because they said that's what it was worth. And I said, well, I don't exactly think I have that much money anywhere near it. And besides, I would never go back there to live. So I was delighted when the Park Service took it over, and they have done a beautiful job with it. They've taken very good care of it. It was built by my great-grandfather, Gates. So it wasn't Mother and Dad's house until they left the White House. Margaret Truman Daniel, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but we are, we're rapidly running out here. Thank you for spending a little bit of it with us today. Glad to be here. Margaret Truman Daniel, you can read many of her books, which are uh, still available in print, stories about her parents, as she's told us, and also a number of mystery stories. Let's return to calls about Harry Truman. Newton, New Jersey. Good morning. I'm sorry to miss talking personally to Margaret. I wanted to thank her publicly for her kindness her charm, her sensitivity to a native Kansas City. And my name is Lillian Murphy Sovan, and I was appearing at the National Theater about 1952 or 53 in the Gilbert and Sullivan Festival, which starred Martin Green. Margaret very kindly invited me over to the White House for tea. I was suffering greatly from a cold at the time, and she found a wonderful doctor for me in Washington and arranged for me to come at a later time. As we were having tea in the White House, Daddy strolled by, and she jumped up, and she ran over, and she said, Daddy, come in here. There's someone I want you to meet. 
He was so very gracious to me, apologized for not being able to come to the theater because they were in mourning for his mother-in-law, and indeed made me feel very welcome. I'm so proud to be from Kansas City and to know the Trumans. I want to thank Margaret particularly and the family in general for representing our country in such a wonderful way for their character, for their sensitivity, their graciousness. I love every one of them, and I just wanted to say so publicly. Thank you, caller. Let's uh, take another visit at, uh, to the staff here at the Truman Library, and you're going to meet yet another person here, Ray Gesselbrock, who is special assistant to the director of the Truman Library, who will show you some of the documents available to researchers. What's the first one you have for us? Um, Susan, I, I selected first what I think may be the most remarkable document in our holdings. It's a draft press release, a very unpretentious little document, but this document uh, was the, uh, represents the American recognition of Israel. And I think its remarkable character comes particularly from the fact that President Truman was standing almost all alone when he recognized Israel. The Secretary of State had more or less threatened to resign if Israel was recognized. The Secretary of Defense was strongly opposed. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were opposed. But this little statement says, this government has become informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognized, and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as a de facto authority for the new state, and he had to write this in because the name wasn't known when the document was typed, State of Israel. Truman signed it, dated it, 6-11, 11 minutes after midnight in Tel Aviv, May 15th. 1948, Israel was recognized. Alonzo Hamby, quick thoughts on the significance at the time of the recognition of Israel. Well, for Truman, this, this may really have been the most difficult decision he had to make because Ray's, Ray's quite right. Uh, there were very few people uh, around him who thought that this was worth possibly alienating the entire Arab world. Uh, I, I think uh, he, he made the decision Fundamentally, because he thought it was the right thing to do, it also carried some political benefits with it domestically, to be sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was an enormously important uh, decision. Uh, it would be for any new state to be recognized by the, uh, the most powerful country on earth. We've heard a number of questions this morning, Ray Gesselbrock, about uh, Joe McCarthy. You've got a letter there. Can you show that to us? Sure. McCarthy sent Truman a uh, telegram in 1950, shortly after he had made a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, in which he uh, said that the State Department had 57 known communists and, and accused Truman of hiding information about the communists in government, and really threatened the president that if he didn't reveal all this information, uh, that uh, the Democratic Party would become kind of a, a pro-communist party. Truman uh, apparently dictated a reply uh, he, he chose not to send this reply uh, after, after second thoughts, but this is what he said. He said, I read your telegram. Um, uh, I, he said, this is the first time in my experience that I ever heard of a senator trying to discredit his own government before the world. Your telegram is not only not true and an insolent approach to a situation that should have been worked out between man and man, but it shows conclu conclusively that you are not even fit to have a hand in the operation of the government of the United States. Um, uh, that, uh, I think we, we probably all wish Truman had, had sent this document, uh, but it shows pretty clearly how he felt about Senator McCarthy. We've seen that Harry Truman was quite a letter writer. He was also a diarist. Uh, that's right. And I brought one of his uh, diary books from 1949. Um, President Truman had the ability to put himself on paper, I think, uh, I mean, his, his real person, his real thoughts onto paper in a very immediate way. Uh, the entry I've opened to here is from November 1st, 1949. The uh, Congress had just concluded its work for 1949. 1949 was the year when all the fair deal domestic measures were sent to the Congress, and one by one, uh, not quite all of them, but most of them, the Congress uh, refused to act on them or defeated them. Uh, quite like the present time in some ways. And this was a Democratic Congress? Uh, that's right, but just barely. 
the Republicans and the conservative Democrats held uh, uh, power in this Congress. Truman opens this entry. I have another hell of a day. Look at my appointment list. It's only a sample of the whole year. Trying to make the 81st Congress perform is and has been worse than cussing the 80th. The 80th Congress was Republican. A president never loses prestige fighting Congress. And I can't fight my own Congress. And he says, I've kissed and petted more consarn SOB, so-called Democrats and left-wing Republicans, than all the presidents put together. And he says that things have come out fairly well. He was being very optimistic, very kind to the Congress. Um, and I think he was looking forward to passing more of his uh, fair deal legislation in 1950. And the Korean War interrupted all of that, of course. D Dr. Alonzo Hamby Truman, biographer, talk a little bit about his relationship with his congresses. Well, uh, they were always difficult because, as, as Ray rightly points out, every Congress he was, that he was faced with was dominated by ideological conservatives. Uh, one of them was the Republican 80th Congress, of course, and in, in some ways that was the easiest Congress for him to deal with because he could, he could just stay on the attack. It was much harder when he had to face Congresses in which power was really wielded by a majority coalition of conservative Democrats and Republicans. And uh, a lot of the frustration comes through in that passage Ray just showed us. When did the name Fair Deal get put together for his economic program? Uh, well, it's, uh, it was an economic and social program. And it really surfaces in 1949, although he'd, he'd used the term once or twice before. but. Uh, he, he really raises the flag, I, I stand for a fair deal at the beginning of his second term. Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I'd like to go back to the dropping of the atomic bombs. As I remember, it was just three days between the first bomb and the second bomb. And I'd like to know why Truman didn't uh, take, in, those, in that time, give Japan an ultimatum and a time to surrender before we drop the second one. Do you have any answer to that? Uh, well, actually, an ultimatum had been sent to Japan at the conclusion of the Potsdam Conference. Uh, it did not mention the, uh, the word atomic bomb. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, did know after Hiroshima uh, through both their uh, their own survey of the situation and their own tests and through a U.S. declaration that an atomic bomb had been used on them. Uh, the Japanese high command had some doubts about whether the United States had the resources for a second bomb. Uh, the Nagasaki bomb was moved up uh, a couple of days at least from the original schedule because of impending bad weather. Uh, it does seem it was dropped very quickly, I agree. Uh, and uh, you might raise more questions about that one uh, than the one that was first dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, you can, however, make a very good argument that the, uh, uh, the Japanese would not have surrendered without the second one. It's, it's not a bulletproof argument by any means, but there are indications. Edgewater, Maryland. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, C-SPAN, for this fine show. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Heimby, thank you for your book. My name is Westbrook Murphy. My father, Charles Murphy, served <clears throat> with President Truman uh, at the White House and worked with him afterwards. I'd like to mention specifically the Truman Scholarship Foundation. Uh, you had a question earlier uh, from a student about what had President Truman contributed to this generation. Another caller asked specifically about the Scholarship Foundation, and I don't believe he got a response. Uh, the foundation was really Truman's idea for a memorial. Uh, it was passed by an act of Congress in the uh, mid-1970s. And the foundation recognizes uh, outstanding college students who will undertake uh, a career in the public service uh, after they complete their education. It's a four-year program and $30,000. Uh, we now have about 2,000 uh, Truman Scholars in this uh, marvelous program. 
Well, thank you, sir, for providing more details. Appreciate that telephone call. Let's return to Ray Gesselbrock for some more documents, part of the extensive collection here at the Truman Library. Susan, I, um, again, thinking uh, how, how President Truman could express himself on paper, I've selected some pages from a draft uh, letter that President Truman uh, wrote in January 1946 to his Secretary of State at that time, James F. Burns. Uh, this was uh, not, uh, not too long after the end of World War II, um, and uh, at, the, at the time, the term Cold War was unknown. That wasn't coined until the end of 1947. Dr. Hamby said earlier that really the declaration of Cold War was in March 1947 at the time of the Truman Doctrine speech. This is over a year earlier. But he's writing about his frustration with the Soviet Union. He talks about the, the Soviet failure to keep their agreements uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe and in Iran and in Turkey. And he says, he says here, unless Russia is faced with an iron fist and strong language, another war is in the making. Only one language do they understand. How many divisions have you? I do not think we should play compromise any longer. And then he concludes the letter, I'm tired of babying the Soviets. I think that you can detect the, the germ of, uh, of Cold War uh, in this letter. Alonzo Hamby com comments. Well, uh, very clearly, you, you do detect more than a germ in that letter. Uh, which Truman wrote uh, in a state of considerable frustration with Burns uh, at the end of 1945 after uh, Burns had been uh, proceeding with uh, some extended negotiations in Moscow without keeping the White House informed. Uh, there is uh, considerable debate about whether that letter was ever given to Burns or read to him and I, I think uh, the weight of the evidence suggests that Truman expressed his frustrations, as he frequently did, and put the letter away. But, uh, yeah, clearly, by the end of 1945, he was having considerable doubts about the Soviet Union. Ray Gesselbrock, final document for us. Um, this is a, a letter that President Truman sent to a, a Kansas City friend, Ernie Roberts. Uh, this is dated August 1948. This was about three weeks after Truman had issued his executive order to desegregate the armed forces. Uh, people might not remember about Harry Truman, who was basically a southerner by background, that he was the first president since Reconstruction to have a, a strong civil rights program, to put forward uh, important civil rights legislation. This particular correspondent uh, didn't agree uh, with the civil rights program, and President Truman uh, has written him this letter, and he... He says, the main difficulty with the South is that they are living 80 years behind the times, and the sooner they come out of it, the better it will be for the country and themselves. He says, I'm not asking for social equality because there's no such, thi no such thing exists, but I am asking for equality of opportunity for all human beings, and as long as, as I can stay here, I'm going to continue that fight. He talks about uh, some episodes, some horrible episodes involving... World War II veterans, African Americans, after uh, the war. One case in Monroe, Georgia, where two African Americans and their wives were pulled out of cars and, and shot down in a particularly brutal fashion. Another episode involving Isaac Woodard, a veteran, was, was blinded uh, and, and beaten up badly in South Carolina. Truman concludes the letter, I can't approve of such goings on, and I shall never approve it as long as I am here as I told you before, I'm going to try to remedy it, and if that ends up in my failure to be reelected, that failure will be in a good cause. How many documents do you think you have altogether, from Harry uh, Truman? We have uh, 15 million pages in our holdings. We probably have somewhere between oh three and five thousand pages that you would call Truman personal writings, letters, and diary material, things like that. Thank you for showing us just five of those to get a better understanding of his presidency. Thank you. Alonzo Hamby, our guest, we have just about eight minutes left, and there's still so much in the administration that we didn't cover. Uh, let's take a telephone call from Las Vegas. I hear what's on your mind. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Violet Young. I was uh, stationed in uh, 
uh, I went to the military in 1951. Uh, I went to uh, Fort Lee, Virginia for basic training. That was integrated. Went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. That was integrated. But when I was stationed permanent party, Fort Knox, Kentucky, it was segregated, the Women's Army Corps. Uh, for about a year, I believe, we were segregated, and then we were integrated, and there were quite a few problems at that time. This was in 1952. And do you have a question for us? Our time is short. I just wanted to know, uh, if they, since basic training was integrated and AIT was integrated, why was I, we segregated in 1952? Thank you. Up to this. I, I, I don't have a good answer for that other than it was a long process and there was a lot of resistance within the Army. Walnut Hill, Louisiana. Yes, hello. My name is O.N. North. I'm calling from Walnut Hill, Louisiana. At some point, President Truman had his Secret Service bodyguards drafted into the U.S. Army as privates. My question is, what events led to this action? And I thank you for your program. Yeah. Afraid I know nothing about that. With regard to the presidency, during his administration, uh, the 22nd Amendment was passed, mm -hmm. uh, which limited presidents to two terms. Yes, uh, and uh, on the whole, it was something he approved of. He, he thought that two terms were enough for a president. This was one of the reasons he decided not to run again in 1952. He had, uh, he had after all, uh, come within three months of serving two full terms. He also lobbied for presidential pensions. Until that time, presidents received no remuneration right. after they left office. Was he successful? Uh, he, uh, he, he was successful uh, after uh, something of an extended effort. Uh, he, as, as we've seen, he came from a family that did not have a lot of money, uh, to say the least. Uh, he had not been successful in saving up a great deal while he was president. Uh, and he, uh, he really thought his resources were stretched pretty thin uh, when he got back here in independence and uh, discovered that ex-presidents uh, have all sorts of demands made on them and get uh, huge mail sacks full of letters that have to be answered and maintain an office and the like. And did he have the same vice president throughout the eight years? Uh, well, okay, he didn't have a vice president in his first oh, term at all, of because course. Because it was not because there was not vice a presidents process. were not replaced then, and uh, uh, he was instrumental in getting the presidential succession law changed so that the Speaker of the House would be next in line at that point, rather than Secretary of State, because he thought that was proper. Uh, he, uh, his vice president in his second term was Albin Barkley, uh, uh, a much loved veteran senator from Kentucky who had been. Uh, Democratic Majority Leader. How old was Alvin Barkley? Uh, Barkley was older than Truman uh, by, I think, four or five years. Uh, and privately, and without meaning anything malicious, uh, Truman would refer to him as Old Man Barkley from time to time. Cleveland, you're on the air. Uh, yes, this is uh, Ken Killen calling from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm home recuperating from uh, open heart surgery and enjoying your program very much. Thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to relate an anecdote that uh, I got from a cab driver in Washington a few years back. He picked Okay. Uh, I have to tell you our time is short, so a brief okay. story, please. Uh, I asked him if he had any uh, famous people in his cab. He said he had Harry Truman in there once when he was president. I said, tell me about that. He said, I saw a man eating popcorn in front of a theater in the afternoon. I pulled over, and it was the president. He got in, and he said, son, you know who I am? Uh, yes, Mr. President, then you know where I live. Take me there. And the President was nice enough then to send him a letter uh, afterwards and a signed picture. President certainly can't do that today, can they, Dr. Henry? It's a great story. It may be true. Are there lots of apocryphal stories about Harry Truman? Uh, I, I think there are about any famous person, sure. And uh, and it's 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 often hard to. Uh, to separate fact from, from fiction when, when you get into that realm. We've learned that Harry Truman returned to Independence, Missouri after his presidency. How many years did he live after the White House? Um, he came back in early 1953, and he died at the end of 1972. And made arrangements for this library to also be the site of his and Beth's graves. We'll show you that now. It's in the courtyard that surrounds this circular building. 
And why did he want to be buried here? Uh, I, I think he, he simply thought that it was uh, appropriate, uh, given his office, that, that this would be uh, the, uh, the site that should be his final resting place. His office uh, looks out over the yes. site that ultimately became, became his uh, grave site. When you go down to the exhibition here, there's a, there's a quote from him that talked about being able to still get up and go to work <laughs> after, uh, after uh, he, his days were numbered here. Del Mar, California, as we look at the grave and the gravestone of Harry Truman listing his uh, career and also Bess Truman lying by his side with her uh, life and uh, cites her as mother of Margaret Truman and also her years as First Lady. Del Mar, California, go ahead, please. I wondered if you could enlighten me as to uh, what happened at the meeting at Potsdam. Uh, here we are half a century later. Our two main problems are... China and Korea, and I've just always been curious why Harry Truman thought the partition of Korea and sort of abandoning our, our allies there in China uh, was appropriate, since I don't think even um, the Russians fought in the Pacific part of the war. And so could you enlighten us as to who influenced him? Was it somebody in the administration that was pro-Soviet, or was it his idea, or why would we ever partition Korea? Uh. Well, I, I think Korea, first of all, was, was partitioned mostly by accident and military convenience. Uh, the Soviet Union did declare war on uh, Japan uh, one week before VJ Day, uh, just, just after the, uh, the first atomic bomb was dropped. Uh, and they did so in accord with an agreement that they had made uh, much earlier, much before Potsdam. Uh, that they would go to war against Japan three months after the end of the European War. Uh, Russia had, uh, had long been a, a Far Eastern power with extensive interests in Manchuria. Uh, the decision on China, uh, I think, uh, was, it doesn't really relate to anything that happens at Potsdam. Uh, it just results from a feeling that uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government is weak, which it was, very corrupt, which it was, uh, militarily not very competent, uh, which was also true, uh, and that there was very little the United States could do to affect the course of events in China, which is a, a, a huge land mass, uh, which even in those days would have had a population of uh, probably 500 million people. As we wrap up here, I want to say thanks to the staff of the Truman Library, including Larry Hackman, the director, and our guests, Ray Gesselbrock and Clay Bowski. Also to Carol Baines and to the audiovisual archivist here, Pauline Testerman. Saw a lot of footage of Harry Truman today that helps gives you, uh, gives you a sense of the man and his family, and it, we appreciate her help. Also thanks to the National Park Service. They operate the Truman Home on Delaware Street that you saw on videotape, and you can come see it on tour if you visit Independence, Missouri. Let's go next to Atlanta. Going to be our last call. This is Homer from Atlanta, and I understand during World War II that the United States government supported Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, and uh, with the understanding that eventually uh, we would support their independence move, and yet after World War II, we immediately just pulled the rug out from them and let the French come back in. Could you comment on what Harry Truman had to do about that? Uh, well, I think Harry Truman personally had very little to do with it. Uh, I, I think it's, it's not so much that in World War II uh, uh, the Roosevelt administration supported Ho Chi Minh. I think uh, uh, Roosevelt was uh, very wary of letting the French reestablish a colonial empire in Indochina. Uh, he thought it uh, couldn't survive, it was the wrong thing, and that uh, uh, old-style European imperialism had had its day at the end of World War II. Also, thanks to Pam Myers and her colleagues at the Truman Birthplace. That's in Lamar, Missouri. You can visit that as well. And to Margaret Truman Daniel for joining us by telephone today. And to our local affiliates here in Independence, uh, Jones Intercable in Kansas City and uh, Time Warner. Jones Intercable in Independence, I'm sorry. And Time Warner runs the system in Kansas City. We have about 30 seconds left, uh, Dr. Alonzo Hamby. And I want to have you wrap up by telling us what kind of world Harry Truman left us in 1953. Uh, well, he, uh, he left us a world in which the United States was uh, much more secure and prosperous than uh, uh, the one into which he had been born. Uh, and 
He had, he had something to do with that. He obviously didn't have sole responsibility for it, but I, I think most people look objectively at his, president have to feel, his presidency have to feel it was constructive. This is Alonzo Hamby's biography of Harry Truman. It's called Harry, A Life of Harry Truman, A Man of the People. It is available in paperback from Oxford Press. Oxford University Press. And there are also lots of uh, other books as well. You can read lots about Harry Truman if we've piqued your in interest, including one about the uh, collected letters called Dear Bess. And then there's also the David McCullough biography that many of you are familiar with, and others if you'd like to read more. But thank you for being with us here today at the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri for the life and times of Harry Truman.